Godzilla and Kong, two sides of an ancient rivalry once etched in stone, now chronicled in a cinematic universe going strong after 10 years. I just recapped the timeline, and now that Godzilla x Kong is here, I thought I'd look back and review the MonsterVerse. We'll go one at a time, briefly recapping each movie or show before reviewing it in depth, concluding with my review of Godzilla x Kong The New Empire. Now, just like Bill Randa on his crusade to Skull Island, I'm gonna need some help. So joining me on this journey are Tony and Johanna, hosts of the Godzilla-themed podcast, Castzilla vs. the Pod Monster. After each of my reviews, they'll give their thoughts so we get a more complete picture from a couple of bona fide experts in the field of giant monsters. Now, let's rewind back to 2014 and remember how the MonsterVerse got its start. This is Gareth Edwards' Godzilla. In 1999, scientists Dr. Ishiro Serizawa and Dr. Vivian Graham are summoned to the Philippines to investigate something strange. A mining company found a radiation pocket and brought machinery to dig for uranium. But the ground collapsed under them and radiation levels rose as though contact with the outside air catalyzed something. In the cavern, the scientists find the ancient skeleton of a colossal lizard, and next to it, two big spores. One dormant and one already hatched, part of the reaction from exposure to the surface. Whatever it hatched left a trail leading to the sea. In Japan, nuclear power plant supervisor Joe Brody has unknowingly been tracking its movements because it emits tremors which he's been picking up. Joe sends someone he trusts to investigate. Sandra Brody, his wife. While she and the team investigate, the tremors arrive and gravely damage the plant. The whole city is at risk of contamination, and Joe has no choice but to seal the corridor, condemning his wife on the other side of it to die. Fifteen years later, their son Ford works for the Navy in explosive ordnance disposal. After over a year away, he's returning home to San Francisco to El and Sam, his wife and son. But the reunion is short-lived, because when he finds out his dad's been arrested again, he's off to Japan to bail him out. Since losing his wife, Joe has never stopped his crusade for the truth. They say it was a natural disaster, but he knows there was something else at that plant, so he's been sneaking into the quarantine zone around the old plant. The tremors recently started again. Whatever killed his wife is talking again, and he can prove they're the same as the ones from 15 years ago if they get his old research from the quarantine zone. Seeing his father's desperation, Ford joins him on another trip into the zone, and they're both taken into custody at the plant, where the thing that hatched in 99 has been cocooning. As the lights flicker, Joe warns this thing could take them back to the Stone Age. It can absorb radiation, then release it as an EMP. And soon, a colossal insect hatches from the cocoon. Ford survives the attack, while his father is mortally wounded. But Sarazawa and Graham heard Joe's ravings before his death. He knew what he was talking about, so they recruit Ford to find out what else his father knew. First, they fill Ford in. Millions of years ago, Earth was populated by massive creatures who feed off radiation. As radiation on the surface subsided, they went deep underwater to feed off radiation from the core. But in 1954, the first time a nuclear sub reached the lower depths, they awakened one of them, Godzilla, the one at the top of the primordial ecosystem. Their organization, Monarch, was formed to research these creatures, and in 1999, they discovered two more, parasitic spores which once killed a creature like Godzilla. The one that hatched went looking for food, i.e. radiation, and found some at the plant. It spent 15 years feeding and finally hatched today. They ask Ford what else his father said, and he remembers Joe described the tremors as talking, which raises the question, who was it talking to? Meanwhile, the Navy starts tracking the massive unidentified terrestrial organism, or MUTO. They find it in Hawaii feeding on a nuclear sub it nabbed, until Godzilla rises off the coast and fights it off. The next day, they realize who the MUTO is talking to the other Muto, and if they're talking, the other Muto has likely finally hatched. 
Sure enough, they find it trampling through Vegas. They quickly realize what's going on. The first Muto is male, and it's talking was a mating call, his way of telling the female he's reached maturity and is ready to mate. So she emerged. Now both are on their way to San Francisco, and so is Godzilla. Serizawa believes he is hunting them, and he thinks humanity's best bet is to let him fight this battle. But trusting nature is not a plan the Navy can get behind. Instead, they decide to wait for the monsters to meet, then drop a nuke on them. As an explosives expert, Ford offers to help, and if they're heading to San Francisco, it'll get him back to his family too. But on the way, the female Muto is attracted by the nuclear material and eats most of their bombs. Despite the setback, they continue on toward San Francisco, where Elle has put their son on a bus to evacuate the city while she waits behind for Ford's return. That bus ends up on the Golden Gate Bridge, directly in Godzilla's path. The Navy fires their missiles and he stands to absorb the barrage, shielding the civilians on the bridge. But as the missiles keep flying, Godzilla eventually careens through the bridge, just as Sam's bus speeds past the carnage to safety. When Joe and the Navy reach the city with their one remaining bomb, the male Muto sets off an EMP, then grabs the nuke and brings it to the middle of the city. A nuke that's already set to detonate in 90 minutes, with an analog timer immune from the EMP. It can't be stopped remotely, so Ford and the team parachute into the city. They work on the bomb while Godzilla fights the Mutos. Working together, Ford gets the bomb off the bay and away from civilization, while Godzilla claims victory over the Mutos. Before the bomb detonates, Ford is picked up by a rescue helicopter, and when the sun rises, he reunites with his family, while Godzilla roars to the sky before returning to the sea, crowned by the public as savior of their city and king of the monsters. I gotta say, it's weird watching this movie today because tonally, it's so different from the MonsterVerse of 2024. With Godzilla, director Gareth Edwards aimed for something that felt grounded. Now, if I were to list words describing Godzilla vs. Kong or Godzilla x Kong, that word probably wouldn't make the list no matter how far down you went. But either approach can work, and in the case of this movie, I think staying grounded was the right choice. Because we've seen plenty of monster movies and plenty of Godzilla movies by this point, so a unique approach is necessary to make them special again. In this movie, we don't get many of the typical sweeping shots from high up to get the best angle on the action. Instead, the camera is mostly in lockstep with people, similar to a found footage movie where we can only see what characters see. And like a found footage movie, it does make the proceedings feel a little more real. At the plant when Joe and Ford are taken into custody and the Muto hatches, we see it in the distance or from the ground, craning our necks to look up. Because in reality, if you're getting attacked by a giant bug, the last thing on your mind would be finding the best spot for a good view. This approach helps you feel the scale of Godzilla and the Mutos, and after years of CGI rendering every insane thing we can imagine, finding a way to reground us in reality before introducing us to monsters goes a long way to returning the awe these images should inspire. The best example has to be when Ford and the team parachute into the middle of San Francisco where Godzilla and the Mutos are already fighting. As they fall through the storm clouds, this choral, almost religious sounding music plays, and you can feel that these people are falling into a world they have no place in a world of gods and monsters. They catch glimpses of the battle in progress, and instead of, wow, that looks cool, the usual reaction to a scene like this, the thought is, wow, that looks terrifying. The grounded nature of this movie isn't just in the camera work, but also in the way it doesn't sugarcoat collateral damage. Godzilla simply stepping onto the shore sets off tsunamis that wreak havoc in Honolulu. On the other hand, sometimes the movie straddles the line of concealing the action because we're following characters, 
or concealing the action because it's saving it all for the climax. The most egregious example is in Honolulu. Ford is on a train to the airport so he can get back home to San Francisco. Godzilla meets the Mutos in battle and Ford's train gets derailed. As it hangs off the tracks and he holds on for dear life while saving a child, we cut to San Francisco where you can see the battle on TV for a second. Then cut to the next day, Ford has safely gotten off the derailed train, and the kid he saved is efficiently reunited with his parents. Nothing motivates the cut other than, we don't want you to see too much monster action yet. It almost comes off as a wink to the audience, like, we know what you want to see, but you're gonna have to wait. But for a movie that generally feels like it's trying to stay grounded, such a blatant wink at the audience can be distracting. It's an odd, disjointed moment, and honestly, the whole movie feels oddly disjointed. In fact, it feels like two movies stuck together, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. The first is a sci-fi mystery thriller, where Brian Cranston's character fights to uncover the truth in the wake of losing his wife. And the second is the disaster movie you expect from Godzilla. The first movie starts strong. It's something we've seen before. You have to shut the door, but they're still trapped inside. It's a familiar and cliched tragedy, but the sequence works. It's elevated by strong performances from Brian Cranston and Juliette Binoche. And it's staged effectively, where it's such a long corridor in front of Joe, it does a great job emphasizing just how far away she is and how unlikely it is she'll be able to reach him. You can really feel the distance. After that opener, we skip ahead 15 years and Cranston's character devolves a bit into the standard crackpot, complete with a crazy wall. He's still fun to watch because he's Brian Cranston, then he's killed off. On the one hand, this raises the stakes because it tells you no one is safe. On the other hand, once you enter the second movie, you find out none of the other characters are as fun or as interesting to watch. So no one is safe, but you don't care about anyone all that much. Once you enter the disaster movie, it also makes you wonder, what was the point of the mystery aspect? It all builds up to a reveal no one is surprised by. You ready for this? You might want to sit down. There are big monsters out there, and one of them is named Godzilla. Of course, there are details we learn. The monsters eat radiation. The Mutos are spores who look like bugs and have killed Godzilla's kind before. But that explanation is not satisfying enough to warrant this mystery story. So what purpose does that first part of the movie serve? From a character standpoint, Joe's death motivates Brody to an extent. Before dying, his father tells him to get home to his family. It's a moment of regret because Joe left his family on the crusade to figure out what happened to his wife. But there isn't much motivation there for Ford. Whether or not his father died this way or left those parting words, I can't imagine Ford would have done a whole lot differently. Either way, with a giant lizard in San Francisco where his family lives, I think he would have tried to get there and do what he could to save them. Maybe if Ford felt pressure to carry on his father's crusade or prove it was not in vain, there'd be more connective tissue. But in the end, what we're left with is that Joe had some insights into the monsters, which helped Sarazawa and Graham. Kind of. Ford remembers that his father described the Tremors as talking, which gives them the idea the Muto is talking to the other Muto, and they realize she's hatched. But they realize it too late. Even without Joe's insight, a giant bug trampling through Vegas is hard to miss. Ultimately, the Joe Brody story arc, thanks to Cranston, elevates moments of this movie, but never justifies itself as necessary to the overall story. Instead, I'm left asking, why didn't we just follow Sarazawa and Graham, who are intimately involved in the Godzilla story the whole time? Why did we instead take a detour to this other character on the outside of everything? I suspect it's because following scientists trying to stop the disaster in a disaster movie is too typical, and I like trying something different, but it doesn't quite work here. Now, we have to, of course, talk about Godzilla himself. He's an interesting character in this movie because it isn't obvious where he stands. Does he care about humanity? 
Or are we just in the way between him and his prey? Serizawa is our main insight into these questions and the one who most highlights the movie's themes. In Edward's depiction, Godzilla and the Mutos are a way of reminding us that nature is powerful. We have much more control over it than we used to. We have much more capacity to survive natural disasters than ever before, for example. Perhaps that's led to some arrogance. As Sarazawa says, the arrogance of man is thinking nature is in our control and not the other way around. But we also aren't necessarily destined for extinction because nature has a balance and Godzilla will enforce it. But it's never clear just how intentional that is. Yes, Godzilla wants to kill the Mutos, but does he care about us? There's a great scene on the Golden Gate Bridge where Ford's and L's son is on an evacuation bus. That bridge ends up in Godzilla's path. When the Navy launches missiles, Godzilla stands in their way. It almost seems like he's shielding the civilians, but we can't say for sure it's intentional. And when he careens through the bridge, it's only after taking a barrage of missiles. So the movie hints at the possibility he cares about protecting people without outright saying it. That helps to keep him a mysterious figure and helps to sell him as a terrible force of nature beyond our control. And it's definitely beyond the control of these characters because not only are they bland, they're also kind of inept. Opposite Sarazawa and Graham is the US Navy. Despite the knowledge that Godzilla and the Mutos eat nuclear material and radiation, despite the knowledge that the nuclear bomb tests in the 50s were actually attempts at killing Godzilla and they all failed, the US Navy's plan is to wait for Godzilla and the Mutos to converge, lure them off the coast, and then drop a nuke on them. On the face of it, it's a plan destined to fail. I think the theme of nature versus control would be more interesting if there was a stronger counterpoint to Sarazawa, but instead, the counterpoint is nonsense. And the plan doesn't just fail, it fails spectacularly. On their way to San Francisco, the female Muto eats most of the nukes. They continue on with the plan, and the next day, the Mutos take their other nuke. So now they've made the same blunder twice in a row. Not to mention the nuke is already armed to detonate with an analog timer and the Mutos have brought it to the middle of the city. Now soldiers need to risk their lives to get it out before it wipes out a chunk of San Francisco. The plan could not have gone worse. The challenge of let them fight is where do humans fit into that story? And I wish they found something better than coming up with terrible plans screwing them up, and then having to fix their own mistakes. Especially when it feels so telegraphed by the fact that Ford Brody is a bomb expert. So of course they have to manipulate events so that in the end, it all comes down to a bomb. On a more positive note, even if it took some plot contrivances to get there, it's cool that Ford and Godzilla find a way to help each other out in the fight. Ford torches the Mutos' eggs, which distracts the Mutos, giving Godzilla a chance to recover. And though it's a bit repetitive, both times a Muto menacingly approaches Ford, Godzilla comes to his aid. Then there's the nice moment at the end of the battle where both of them collapse from exhaustion, like we were in this together. So in the end, I'm pretty mixed on this movie. As far as spectacle goes, Gareth Edwards found a unique way to showcase it that definitely makes the movie worthwhile. But as is often the case with movies like this, the human characters fall short. I think if given more opportunity, Ken Watanabe could have brought more to his role. Serizawa has a graveness to him, but also a faith in Godzilla that makes him interesting but he doesn't get much to do, other than push back on Navy officer William Stenz and educate Ford on monarch history. But maybe I'm being too hard on this movie. Let's hear from Castzilla and see what real Godzilla fans have to say about all this. Thanks, Gil. We'll give our opinions right now. Godzilla 2014. It's okay. Yeah, it, it, it's all right. Um... Brian Cranston definitely was amazing in the beginning. Uh, that actually was pretty sad. Yeah. With the whole white thing. I was like, oh, hoo, hoo. was yeah. not expecting that. But then all the humans after that kind of exist. And they're yeah, the, there. the human story, the human characters are pretty Maybe. weak. I thought the advertisements were a little misleading. I thought this was going to be like a serious 
Godzilla movie in tone with the original yeah, I was one. Say, it's serious, but not like that. No, it turned out to turned out to be a monster fight, which I'm like, oh, this is too serious Let of a tone. Them fight. <laughs> this is too serious of a tone for a monster fighting Godzilla movie. Um, but I thought it was overall decent. Um, my one main issue, which has been fixed, thank God, uh, was how dark it was. I couldn't see anything. Yes, it uh, it was fine in the theaters. The initial home release and the version that streams is still way too dark. But the new 4K release from a few years back, specifically the 4K disc version, fixes the brightness issue. Uh, but yeah, overall, it told us everything we needed to know about the MonsterVerse. It Did set you us like up. his design? I thought the design was really good. I like the chonky design. I like the design. I like the gills. Uh, he felt like Godzilla and did Godzilla things. And honestly, he actually has more screen time than he does in a lot of the Japanese movies. I know that's a complaint. He's not in it enough, but I feel like maybe the old That movie... one scene was such a like, oh, Yeah, there were some holes. letdowns. It could have been a lot better. It felt like they didn't know what if they wanted to be more subtle or more action packed. No, the, the and... one where everybody goes to hide and they're about to fight and then the thing closes. I was like, come on. Yes, yes. But the final <laughs> battle made up for it. Again, yes. if you watch a version of the movie where you can see it. Yes. But overall, we give it a okay. Thank you, Castzilla versus the Pod Monster. Great review. The lighting issue is definitely something I noticed, by the way, when reviewing the recap before publishing it. I'd hear myself narrating what's happening, but on screen, I just don't see anything. So I'm like, is that what's happening? So in some parts, I turn the brightness way up so you can actually see it. It also brings up a good point that these movies are definitely best enjoyed on the big screen. Or in prep for this video, I rewatched all of them in a virtual theater on my Vision Pro, and that came pretty close to recapturing the magic. I'm not sure I've justified the price tag on that thing yet, but I used it for this video, so it's officially a business expense. Anyway, we've met Godzilla. Now, let's meet the other guy, who actually came first. The original Godzilla came out in 1954, King Kong beat him by over 20 years, releasing in 1933, though technically he was first introduced in the 1932 novel written as a way to market the upcoming film, a novel that's now in the public domain. But it's complicated because the movie is still under copyright, but only until 2029. So get ready for Winnie the Pooh vs. King Kong in just a few years. Until then, this is 2017's Kong Skull Island. The year is 1973, 41 years before the public will meet Godzilla and learn that monsters are real. But Bill Randa believes in them already, because one of them destroyed his ship in World War II, the USS Lawton, and the attack was covered up. Ever since, as the sole survivor, Bill has been on a crusade to prove monsters exist. It's his belief that they come from a hidden world beneath our own, the Hollow Earth, an idea that's been substantiated by scientist Houston Brooks, and they believe there is an entrance to this world on a place called Skull Island. Monarch approves an expedition. They're joined by a military escort led by Colonel Packard, an ex-British SAS captain with expertise in uncharted jungle terrain, James Conrad, and anti-war photographer, Mason Weaver. When they arrive on the island, they drop bombs to test the island's seismic response. That's when they learn the island is protected by a giant ape who doesn't appreciate the explosions. He knocks them out of the sky, kills half of Packard's men, and separates the groups. Randa and Packard in one, Conrad and Weaver in the other. Both quickly learn the island is teeming with monsters. But Conrad's group also finds natives, and they're surprised to find someone among them who can translate, an American, World War II pilot Hank Marlowe. He tells his story. In 1944, he and a Japanese pilot, Gunpei Ikari, were fighting until both crashed here. In order to survive, the enemies became friends, until Gunpei was killed by a big lizard, one of the creatures Hank calls skull crawlers. These creatures terrorized the Iwi natives for thousands of years, until giant apes began protecting them. Most of the apes have been killed off, except one who remains, Kong king of the island, and to these people, God. Conrad and Weaver tell him that in three days, a refueling team will be coming to the north of the island. If they make it in time, they can all go home. 
and Hank has a boat which can get them there, something he and Gunpei built from the scraps of their planes. They work on getting the boat ready while Weaver has a look around. She finds a giant buffalo trapped under one of the downed copters and tries to free it. Kong spots her and helps lift it. Soon they reconvene with Packard's group and get some bad news. The colonel has no intention of heading north to the extraction point. He wants to go back to find one of his men who got separated, Chapman. The rest begrudgingly follow, which means a trip through the boneyard, skullcrawler hunting grounds filled with the remains of Kong's family. Hank warns against it, but Colonel Packard is insistent. And sure enough, they're attacked. Bill Randa is killed, but most of them survive thanks to Marlowe and Conrad wielding Gunpei's sword, and Weaver's ingenuity, using a lighter to ignite a gas pocket. In the midst of it all, the crawler also spits out a skull and the dog tag of the man it belonged to. Chapman, the man Packard's been searching for, is dead. But that won't stop him, because this was never about finding Chapman. In truth, Packard wants to go back to grab their weapons and munitions. So, they can kill Kong and avenge his fallen soldiers. Hank warns that Kong is the island's protector. If he dies, the big skull crawler, the one that's been hiding, will emerge. So, Packard insists, they'll kill it too. The group splits again. Conrad, Weaver, and Brooks focus on escape, while the soldiers carry on their insane colonel's mission. But soon, Conrad and Weaver run into Kong, and in his eyes, they see a thinking being. He looks at Weaver and seems to recall her good deed, trying to help that buffalo. Kong approaches peacefully, and she puts her hand on him. After the encounter, Weaver and Conrad both know they can't let him die. So when Packer draws the beast with napalm, Conrad and Weaver follow. By the time they arrive, Kong already lies unconscious after a bombardment of hidden napalm in the lake. The soldiers place more explosives on him until Conrad, Marlowe, and Weaver draw their own weapons. There's no reasoning with Packard, but when his men realize he's lost it, they abandon the insane mission and instead choose escape. Once Packard is alone, he tries to detonate the bombs, but Kong's fist kills him first. As the rest of them make their way north, Kong is left to contend with the Big Skull Crawler, who emerged while he was unconscious. It's a close fight, but with some extra help from the island's visitors, and the World War II gun mounted on Hank's boat, Kong emerges victorious. Then he watches as those visitors leave his island. And finally, Lieutenant Hank Marlowe of the 45th Pursuit Squadron of the 15th ends his three-decade tour. In 1973, he returns home to a wife and son. In the aftermath, Conrad and Weaver are taken into Monarch custody, where Brooks debriefs them. They learn Kong isn't the only monster around. There's also Godzilla, and judging by the cave paintings, there are many others too. After watching Godzilla, full of bland characters without much personality, Kong Skull Island is immediately a breath of fresh air. The movie itself is full of personality. Thanks to the period piece aspect, it's set at the end of the Vietnam War. The movie's monster has more personality too. As an ape, Kong gets to be a bit more expressive than Godzilla, and the characters are a lot more fun. The same way Cranston brought gravitas to the Joe Brody role, John Goodman does the same for Bill Randa. He sets the stage for the adventure to Skull Island by injecting the sense of a man on a crusade for the truth. Even before we know exactly why he wants to go, we can feel his urgency in those early scenes before they take off. As the movie's quasi-villain, Samuel L. Jackson does a great job. These movies often depend on human characters doing something for lack of a better word, stupid, like delivering nukes to monsters who feed on nuclear material. But Jackson does a great job selling Packard's Apocalypse Now-inspired obsession with finding an enemy where there is none. His vendetta against Kong, while irrational, is easy to understand and makes for a more compelling impediment to coexistence with Titans than Admiral Stenz. Though the highlight has to be John C. Riley as Hank Marlowe, I love his backstory. Crash landing on the island with a Japanese soldier, then having to put their differences aside to become brothers. Once the others find him in 73, Hank is delightful. He has a slight insane edge to him. 
to be expected after nearly 30 years on the island, counterbalanced by competence and survival, a great sense of humor, and a real warmth. You see that warmth in the way he talks about the natives and their relationship with Kong. You see it when he eulogizes Gunpei before attempting one last escape off Skull Island. And there's humor in the man out of time element. We get to see him hear David Bowie for the first time. He argues with one of the young soldiers over the cubs and tigers. And there's also his self-awareness where he knows how crazy everyone sees him as. And he plays with that. I can't tell when I'm talking or when I'm not talking. You're talking. Am I? Yes. I'm talking? Yes. Your mouth is moving. What? I'm going to stab you by the end of the night. And there's just the generally fun way he delivers lines. Like this one. We can't go west. That's where those skull things live. We have an old saying here, east is best, west is worst. That's why we say it. You know, southwest? We can talk about that, but you're going to need a lot more guns if you're going to go west. <laughs> and I just love his positive attitude. He tells the others how he got married before shipping off, and he learned the day before his crash that she gave birth to a baby boy. He recognizes that after almost three decades, it's unlikely they're waiting around for him. But listen to how he handles it. And the truth is, I don't expect him to be waiting. I'd be fine either way. I just want one last chance to see him. That'd be good enough for me. There are so many other moments I can point out, and I'm gonna include one more because it's one of my favorite moments of the movie. Ants. Big ones. There's one. Sounds like a bird, but it's a fucking ant. He's so likable, you really want to see him get home. So it adds stakes to this movie, which don't really exist in Godzilla, which mostly jettisons character for spectacle. This movie gives you something to hope for, aside from seeing cool monster fights. But you might have already noticed a potential issue. I've talked about Bill, Packard, and Hank. But there are so many other characters in this movie. I haven't even mentioned the two who basically become the main characters, Conrad and Weaver, played by Tom Hiddleston and Brie Larson. This is where the movie starts to give me deja vu, because like Godzilla, it starts to feel disjointed. It's not quite as egregious, but Skull Island also feels like two movies, because we start with Bill Randa. His crusade for the truth is the impetus of the movie, but once they're on the island, he's demoted from protagonist to minor supporting character. Given all this was his idea, you'd think we'd see more of him on the island. You'd think the movie would celebrate his finally confronting monsters again, and this time having witnesses. But he barely has any lines, and like Joe Brody before him, dies unceremoniously. Conrad and Weaver then step into the protagonist roles, but don't have nearly as much to offer as Hank or Packard, both of whom have personal motivations that drive the story. They each want something more than simply survival. Hiddleston and Larson's characters, on the other hand, the actor and actress have natural charm, which makes the characters fun to watch, but beyond that, there's nothing there. Hiddleston is just a hired mercenary, and Larson is the same except she carries a camera instead of a gun. I think there's one sentence of dialogue each that alludes to their motivations, but it's mostly absent. Screenwriter Dan Gilroy, who wrote Nightcrawler and a few episodes of Andor, worked on an earlier draft of the script and revealed there were more backstories and character moments which were removed in the final product. Here's what he said. Bree's character was somebody who was really war-weary and had taken photographs for far too long. She didn't believe in anything, so the first time she saw Kong, it was like an awakening. She comes back to life. Tom Hiddleston's character was a guy whose unit had been attacked by a big monster out of Vietnam, so he was in search of this thing. None of that made it into the movie, and nothing really replaced it. And by the way, at this point, we still haven't named all the characters. And for some of the others, there are little character moments hinted at, but nothing fleshed out. There's kind of some flirtation between Houston Brooks and San Lin. Some of the soldiers have backstories. There is an ongoing motif of Chapman writing letters to his son, Billy. Ultimately, this movie almost has the opposite problem of Godzilla. In that movie, where all the characters were bland, here, they all have personality, but there are too many of them. It is fun to bring them all together and see how they play off each other, but the movie would have benefited from focusing on a smaller number of them, or honestly, making the movie an hour longer. 
Maybe after Peter Jackson's three hours and 21 minute epic, they were a little gun shy, but I really enjoyed these characters. And if they were more fleshed out with individual arcs and needs beyond simply survival, I could easily have watched more. For example, I would have loved if we spent more time in 1944. We'd get to watch Marlo and Ikari overcome their differences to survive, learn about Kong, and figure out how to communicate with the natives. I don't know why, but for some reason, at least with these first two entries, the MonsterVerse tends to focus on the wrong people and either kill off the more interesting ones or just sideline them. And once again, I've made it pretty far into the review without talking much about the main attractions, Skull Island, Kong, and all the other monsters. So another aspect of this movie I love is the sense of discovery. You never know what bizarre creature you're gonna meet next on the island or what sights you'll see. Like this moment where you see what Kong is up to when he doesn't know he's being watched. He checks his wound, takes a drink of water, and eats an octopus, slurping it up like a noodle. The action is also pretty great and creative throughout. The initial attack, like Godzilla, is shot in a way that mostly sticks to a human perspective. It accurately captures the chaos of suddenly getting attacked by an ape so large, your eyes can't take in the entire thing if you're up close. Instead, you'll suddenly see a tree flying into your window, or maybe you catch a glimpse of an impossibly large hand, and if you're truly unlucky, maybe you'll get a close look at some big teeth. These little glimpses sell not only the chaos, but the sheer scale of the beast and the absurdity of humans thinking they have a place in this world. Then there are some great shots like Kong in front of the sun as some of the surviving helicopters approach, and there's creativity in the way he fights. He takes down one helicopter by throwing a body at it, crashes helicopters into each other, or just spikes them out of the sky. I also love the repeated shots of Packard's angry eyes, watching Kong slaughter his men. Like I said earlier, you can feel and empathize with his fury. And unlike the Navy and Godzilla, Packard's plan to take down Kong isn't entirely absurd. In fact, he comes pretty close to completing his mission. He's only stopped by Conrad, Hank, and the others. Aside from Kong, there are those other dangers on the island which are equally creative and terrifying. The one I don't think I'll ever get out of my head is this one. At first glance, it would seem this man has been impaled by a tree, but no, that's the leg of a giant spider going through his mouth. The initial attack and the horrifying ones that follow all do a great job selling the dangers of Skull Island, and the creativity makes them hard to look away from. Another sequence worth shouting out is when they're in the boneyard. They accidentally detonate some poison gas grenades as a bunch of leaf wings attack. And you get this great shot of Conrad slicing them up with a sword borrowed from Hank, which he inherited from Gunpei. The bottom line for me, while this movie is flawed, the sense of discovery on Skull Island, the more fleshed out villain, the more logical role humans played in the story, and the sometimes underdeveloped but fun characters, gives this movie a lot of personality, and possibly makes it my favorite of the franchise. You're probably getting an idea by now what I'm looking for out of these movies. I enjoy the monster fighting, spectacle, and titan lore, but for me, character has to come first. And I think these movies are at their best when strong characters collide with the world of titans. And now, let's see what Castzilla has to say about all this. Enough monkey business, Johanna. We have to talk about Kong Skull Island. I'm a big King Kong fan. Uh, I didn't know what this movie was going into it other than it was in continuity with Godzilla. Uh, it turns out it's more of a homage to the Toho King Kong, not necessarily the classic yeah. Kong. Where he's fighting goofy monsters, he's walking upright. Um, yeah, we saw this one together in theaters, and I think we thought it was just okay, but I think we both warmed up on it. What do you, how do you yeah, feel about um, it? Uh, I don't even know where to begin. Um, <laughs> I don't, it, it felt like it was setting up because it had the blonde lady. Brie Larson. Yeah, I know who Brie Larson is. I'm just talking in Captain general. Marvel. Oh my gosh. From the Marvels. The force is female. Um, so anyway, uh, I thought it was going to be another type, you know, King Kong mm. stereotype. You know, 
we got this. Yeah. Um, Tom Hiddleston is... Loki. From Thor Stop. Ragnarok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is... They were trying to, like, cash in on the Marvel thing. They were trying to make Monarch basically... They do it more in the next one, but they were kind of set... They were. Tr this is where they really tried to make Monarch feel like S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah. Uh, look, I like some of the characters in this, like Samuel Jackson, John C. Riley, and John Goodman. John C. Riley probably... Uh, probably the best one. John yeah. C. Riley yeah. is the best character yeah. in this. The problem is this movie has 10,000 characters and... Even though they're played by good actors, yeah, I don't remember anybody's names. I, really, I just, I really yeah. don't remember most of them, to be honest. That's one good thing about this movie. Every time you turn it on, it'll feel like you're watching it the first time because you forget. <laughs> it's like a new movie. You you can only remember the 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 Kong fighting scenes. Yeah, what, and then you're the, like the little, little skeleton dudes, the skull look, crawlers. Yeah, yeah, like that. That I specifically remember being awesome. Like it really is a movie that you. There's the guy who tries to throw the grenade thing. That was hilarious. Yeah, that was hilarious. Everything else, oh. <laughs> you put it on, and you're just like, oh, is that Toby Kebbell? I didn't know he was in this film. <laughs> and it's like I've seen this film five times, and I had no idea. Uh, yeah. It uh, it improved when it came to action. It really uh, shines compared to Godzilla 2014. Yeah. They really embraced the action. Did it in the daytime. It was a fun setting. Yeah, I could see. <laughs> yeah. It was a fun setting for Kong, like in the 70s, which I mean, they did before with the 70s remake of King Kong. But this is like the whole Vietnam thing was a fun aspect to it. Um, no, it's a fun, schlocky time. Yes. Yes. It's yes. very schlocky. I didn't know going in that it was supposed to be like yeah, that. Yeah, we were just kind of like. <laughs> I'm like, when does he get to the Empire yeah. State Building? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but overall, it's inoffensive, I guess. Yeah, I don't hate it. It's definitely lower in my list of like the uh, just monster verse stuff in general. It's the one I've watched the um, least. Yeah, I've probably maybe seen this like three times in my life. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's. If I want to put on some nonsense where I really don't have to pay attention and just kind of turn my brain off, I would throw this on. It is 100%. a turn your brain yeah. off film because you don't have to care about anything. <laughs> And it's not the worst King Kong movie. That's King Kong Lives. So overall, it's another, it's okay. <laughs> we promise we're fans. Huh. The Vietnam War was fun. The whole Vietnam thing was a fun aspect to it. That's uh, an interesting take. I think, uh, you know, a lot of good insights there, though. Glad we mentioned the Marvels. That was good. This is a great collaboration so far. Let's, um, let's get into uh, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, 2019. You'll see this is where the tone of the franchise really starts to change, and we already had an idea that would happen before it came out, because they hired Michael Doherty and Zach Shields to write it. Previously, they worked together on Krampus, the Christmas horror comedy which I reviewed in my Christmas horror special last year. Before that, Doherty made the Halloween anthology movie Trick or Treat, and in addition to writing, he also directed King of the Monsters. He usually gravitates toward a more fun, comedic tone, and he definitely brought that to King of the Monsters. So, let's check it out. It's been five years since Kong fought the Mutos, a day when many were lost, including Mark and Emma Russell's son, Andrew. Mark coped by leaving Monarch and drinking, which estranged him from Emma and their daughter, Madison. Emma coped by staying at Monarch, with a renewed commitment to changing the world in Andrew's honor. She did this by dusting off an old prototype she built with Mark, the Orca, a device which communicates with animals through sonar, but she's since reworked it to communicate with Titans. She soon gets the chance to prove it works when a Titan named Mothra is born and nearly escapes her containment field. Emma activates an alpha frequency, and suddenly, Mothra is calm. But the Orca is powerful, and there are those who want to get their hands on it, including ex-British Army Colonel Alan Jonah and his band of eco-terrorists. They kill anyone in their way, take the Orca, kidnapping Emma and her daughter Madison along with it. Sarazawa and Graham know their best chance at finding them is tracking the Orca, so they recruit the man who helped build it. Mark Russell, a man who despises Godzilla and wants nothing more than to see him dead. When he learns there are 17 more Titans out there, mostly in hibernation, he hopes to see them dead too. 
but of course, to find his daughter, he cooperates. Soon, they find Godzilla leaving his hunting grounds. He probably feels threatened, Mark suggests. He's looking for something, maybe the orca. So they follow him to Antarctica, where there is a titan in hibernation, Monster Zero, an apex predator who once rivaled Godzilla. There, Mark learns the truth. Emma is not a hostage. She is working with Jonah, and Mark watches her set off explosives to free Monster Zero, a three-headed dragon that spits lightning. Godzilla rises to fight the beast, giving the team a chance to escape. Mark gets tangled in the wires of a downed craft, until Dr. Vivian Graham runs back to free him at the cost of her life. She's swallowed by one of Ghidorah's three heads, while the rest escape. Afterward, Emma explains herself. In ancient times, there was a natural order where humans and titans coexisted, and she's seen that where titans go, nature flourishes. She intends to free every titan. It'll kill many, but those who survive will do so in a better world, with the natural order restored. She next wakes Rodan out of a volcano near the village of Isla del Mara. Mark and the team save the nearby villagers by drawing Rodan away and into a fight with Monster Zero. Then Godzilla shows up. While the two apex predators fight, the military tells Monarch to clear the area. They have a new weapon they think can take out Monster Zero, and if it kills Godzilla too, so be it. The Oxygen Destroyer. They set it off. Godzilla falls, but Monster Zero rises. It lost one of its heads in the explosion, but quickly grows it back and makes a call heard around the world, simultaneously waking all other titans. The chaos results in the greatest disaster in human history, dubbed the Rise of the Titans. How did Monster Zero survive without oxygen? The Monarch team looks to ancient folklore of a dragon who fell from the stars named Ghidorah. They realize that's who they're up against. Monster Zero is Ghidorah, an alien not of this planet, not part of Earth's natural order. But soon there is hope. A bright light appears in the sky from another titan, Mothra, queen of the monsters. After escaping the facility during Jonah's attack, she cocooned for a time and only now emerged. She sends a signal to her king, and they realize Godzilla is still barely alive, but resting. Mark suggests they can speed up his rest by setting off a nuke and feeding him the radiation. Following Mothra's signal takes them to a vortex, which takes them to a place that until now was only theoretical, the Hollow Earth. Inside, they find an ancient sunken city, and in it, Godzilla. But the unexpected trip to another world fried their circuits, so they can't launch the bomb. Someone will have to carry it, which means exposure to fatal heat and radiation. Serizawa volunteers. He takes the bomb to Godzilla and says goodbye to his old friend, just before it detonates. And above ground, Madison buys humanity a temporary reprieve by stealing the orca, running to Fenway Park, and using the speakers to send out a calming frequency. Titans around the world cease their aggression as Godzilla rises. Ghidorah and Godzilla follow the orca's signal to Boston and meet in battle, while humanity lends a hand with their own firepower. On the ground, Mark finds his daughter with Emma's help. She had hoped to wake each titan one at a time, methodically, but Ghidorah decided to wake them all at once. As a result, they're looking at full extinction of the human race, okay with Jonah and his eco-terrorists, but not her. So she finally broke from them. Meanwhile, Godzilla is nearly defeated, until Mothra sacrifices herself and lets her life energy flow into her king. But he still needs time to recover, so Emma offers her own sacrifice. She runs with the orca, leading Ghidorah away from the battle. Of course, Emma is killed, but her sacrifice gives Godzilla the chance to rise again and claim victory. In the battle's aftermath, the other titans arrive and bow before their king. But elsewhere, Jonah retrieves something Ghidorah left behind, which may be useful in his crusade, a severed head, the one lost thanks to the oxygen destroyer. 
Like I said before, this movie takes a very different approach than Godzilla. King of the Monsters is closer to what you expect from a typical big budget disaster movie. It no longer restrains the camera to human points of view. It's filled with cartoonish characters and wisecracks. Ghidorah. Ghidorah? She's a gonorrhea. Huh? Ghidorah! There's little attention paid to collateral damage or the human cost of all the monster carnage. And the villains are more cartoonish. They would fit in a run-of-the-mill superhero movie, complete with plan-revealing monologues. But all this is used as a springboard for the thing fans were clamoring for. Lots and lots of Titan action. And it looks great. As a kid, I would have loved this, but even today, there's a part of me that will always want to see what it looks like when a giant lizard fights a three-headed dragon who spits lightning. And that's what this movie is all about. Spectacle. So how much you enjoy it will depend on your appetite for really well-rendered CGI action. That's especially true because a lot of the Titan battles happen in somewhat barren places without much sense of scale, like the initial battle in the empty, snowy landscapes of Antarctica, or Ghidorah vs. Rodan inside tropical storm clouds. The movie also plays a lot with color, especially since Ghidorah is perpetually surrounded by a tropical storm, so the environment is often unnaturally chaotic, making it feel like these fights are happening in a cloud of CGI rather than a real physical place. All that made it hard for me to get a ton of mileage out of the action, though playing with colors did occasionally result in some pretty damn cool images like Ghidorah on top of the volcano with this cross in the foreground. This image leans into something Emma says in her monologue about why she's doing all this. She wants to return to a natural order, a forgotten order, where we coexisted in balance with the Titans, the first gods. And there are some moments where you really feel that. More than Godzilla 2014, this movie leans a little further into Titan lore, and that's one of my favorite parts of the movie. I love sci-fi, less as a springboard for action-adventure, and more as an avenue to imagine possibilities, potential futures, or in this case, alternate histories. It was really cool to finally reveal a glimpse of the Hollow Earth and show that ancient civilizations once existed there, in harmony with Titans. Godzilla finds his resting place in an old temple, and the engravings give hints at what that symbiotic relationship looked like, proving what Emma said true, that Titans were worshipped as gods during ancient times. The credits at the end of the movie give further hints, with redacted research notes. Except instead of the usual black bars redacting the text, it's redacted by the actual credits. One interesting part is that the ancient civilization is described as advanced, giving Atlantis vibes. In my absolute favorite part, evidence shows redacted may have even developed telepathic communication with creatures. How cool is that? And on top of that, there is the revelation that Ghidorah is an extraterrestrial, which raises so many other questions. Where is Ghidorah from exactly? And are there other Ghidorahs out there? What is that planet like? This stuff isn't explored much in the movie, but it gets your imagination running and opens the doors for further exploration in sequels. Now, if you can't tell, I'm trying to say some nice things about this movie, despite the fact that overall, I didn't like it a whole lot. As you can probably tell, spectacle and action, for me, are usually secondary to character and story, unless you're really seeing something unique or impressive. And hey, based on the reaction to minus one, I don't think I'm alone in that. But yeah, character and story are where this movie is at its worst. There is some good stuff with Mark Russell, Kyle Chandler's character. He's probably the one who gets the most range. He's lost his family to drinking and holds a very understandable grudge against Titans but he has to put those feelings aside, and by the end, he's actually fighting alongside Godzilla. I felt like he sold that arc pretty well. On the estranged from his family front, 
there isn't much transformation because he was already talking to his daughter again before the movie starts. Her mom catches her exchanging emails with him. By the end, it's less that he won his daughter back and more she was scared off by her mother turning into Thanos. The whole Emma plot bugged me. Normally, you can hand wave a villain's motivation and you don't question it too much because you typically only see the villain doing villainous things. Your mind just accepts, oh, they're evil. But when you meet a character like Emma, a mother and scientist who seems pretty normal, and it's a twist that she's actually an insane person who's decided to cull the human race, hand-waving no longer works. Because now your mind naturally wonders about the psychology of this villain. And shocking as it may be, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, isn't really equipped for a deep dive into the psychology of a mass murderer. It also just feels like the movie gives her such a pass. Like we're supposed to feel she's redeemed by the end of it, but I'm okay with executing most of the human race, but total extinction is where I draw the line, isn't much of a redemption. And even if you subscribe to hashtag Thanos was right, getting to the point where you are actually ready to push the button and condemn billions to die means overcoming a biological survival imperative to see humanity thrive. Stripping that away and stripping away all empathy for your fellow humans means a total transformation into a cold, calculated killer. Something I just don't see in this performance. I think the movie would have been better off with a more conventional villain rather than trying to manufacture this twist. Then, they could have spent more time focusing on something simpler when it comes to character development. The struggles of a family that's fallen apart after losing a son. Or, hey, you landed Sally Hawkins and Ken Watanabe for the second time, with three Academy Award nominations between them. Maybe give them something to do in the movie. Both characters sacrificed their lives. Vivian Graham to save Mark, and Ishiro Serizawa to save Godzilla. And by extension, humanity. If either character were more developed, rather than sidelined in both movies as supporting characters, their sacrifices probably would have landed with more impact. To be fair, Watanabe, by sheer force of will, overcomes it to sell that final line. Goodbye, old friend. But imagine how much more meaningful it could have been if we actually felt the degree of life and time Serizawa sank into studying Godzilla. I don't have much else to say about this movie. There's definitely some fun to be had, depending on your mileage for nonstop monster carnage. For me, it would have been improved with better characters, or if it just totally let loose and leaned harder into having fun. Go full on Atlantis and show the ancient city had bizarre advanced technology. Ghidorah is an alien. Show something else that makes him weird other than being able to survive without oxygen. Or bring in the Shobijin, the tiny telepathic fairies who communicate with their god Mothra through song. Anyway, maybe I'm being hard on the movie. Maybe to truly appreciate it, you've got to be a real diehard Godzilla fan. So let's see what Tony and Johanna have to say about all this. That was an interesting take from Gil, but that's just one take. Wink. Uh, 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 <laughs> let's talk about Godzilla King of the Monsters. Um, love it. I don't care. You really I, love this I one. I love it. It's a fun time. They definitely uh, listen to the fans after the complaints from the last one. They're like, okay, Godzilla's going to be fighting a lot. Uh, there's going to be even more monsters, and it's going to be all the ones you know. Yep. We're going to spend a lot of money on getting the ones that you know, and they're going to get a lot of screen time, except for the second most popular one. She will get the least amount of screen she, time. Every time she was on screen... Dominating, yeah. dominating presence. This this <laughs> felt like a course correction. They're like, all right, let's not take it so seriously. They're like, uh, Godzilla made more money, but Kong probably got a better reception from people. Yeah. So this is trying to marry it. Uh, it really feels like a big budget Toho film. They work in a lot of references from the old films. The Bear McCreary score. Oh, I w that's the one thing I want to talk about. Yeah. Oh my God. How they did not spend the money and bring him back to do every single one after I don't this. Know why. What is wrong with you? <laughs> it's perfect. I mean, it ends with like a hardcore redo of the Godzilla song by Blue Oyster Cult. I mean, whatever, but also just uh, the scene yeah. where Mothra, when she finally hatches and she's coming out of the waterfall yeah. and then you hear her theme mix 
mixed in with it. Yeah. <laughs> Chills. Um, <laughs> as a big fan of King Ghidorah, he finally looks the way I've always really wanted him to look. I still, so like, <laughs> I love his design in this. I love his, like, roar. Yeah. Like, just like, yeah. I can't unsee that one meme where he's, like, super mad and just, like, Rrr. then there's the one who's, like, the also the same, dumb. but he's, like, looking over, and then there's the one who's all, like, derpy with his, like, tongue sticking out. Every time I look at him, I'm just like, yeah, no, because they're always picking on the one. Yeah. Notice, you, like, the two heads always go for the other head. And spoiler <laughs> for the next one, that one ends up becoming Mechagodzilla. It's so funny. The one, they really, that, that middle one should have been Mechagodzilla. The movie would have ended probably differently. Yeah. They're like, oh, no, we got the stupid one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> however, it still has some issues. I don't mind uh, the monsters changing the environment but the wind and rain effect with Ghidorah was a little overboard they try to counter it with them like glowing but I don't feel like especially the night scenes Godzilla mm -hmm. and Ghidorah like Ghidorah is like bright and gold he should stand out from the background yeah. he kind of blends in with the background a little too much uh the Rodan scene is probably the best because it's the most visible um and again too many characters and the monarch characters so whatever with the monarch people like they they serve their purpose i still don't get the whole uh it was it vera from for vera farmiga how, however you say her last from name. hawkeye she's a babe but um i don't understand the whole point of her character like she was there to like she was like part of Monarch, and then she was like, wait, no, we should unleash uh, like all these monsters with this terrorist group. Because yes. like it's the way of life or whatever. But then like it takes two seconds for her to like completely change her mind on it. Yeah, a little inconsistent. And then her daughter's just there. Eleven. Uh, really yeah, Bobby Brown, yeah. The the family didn't bother me so much. Sarazawa didn't bother me so much. Oh, I like that scene when he died though. That was sad. Uh no, it's all the wacky monarch characters. Like uh <clears throat> The, the what you call it ice cube son oh yeah the, wa the wise crack he comes back in the second the the Godzilla versus Kong right no, who's the one guy we'll talk about it when we get yeah. to it then <laughs> um I hated the wise cracking white haired scientist he was the wacky one oh but then yeah the, that guy but then there was also Thomas Middleditch who was also the wacky one um so yeah for every like step it made in the right Completely direction ignored that <laughs> yeah uh, and again really cashing in on marvel now they have like a big flying ship like the helicarrier so they, okay here's another issue like yep. probably the only time they bring back another character or at least the two characters or whatever mm -hmm. is the millie bobby brown character and then the dad right in this in the next one no they brought back some characters from 2014 in this sarazawa his assistant no no no, who no, gets no. just like i'm talking about like from this giant cast and oh they yeah bring yeah. them back again right yeah it, from this movie they only bring so back what is to... the point of doing this marvel thing and just not keeping them i guess maybe they thought they were going to do more spin-offs with all these individual characters but the series doesn't have really one character that we're following they should have had. It should have been Brian Cranston. <laughs> it probably should have been Sarah Zell, but they killed him. I mean, um, yeah, but I kind of it, it, it yeah. served its purpose. It's a fun movie. This is another background movie. You can <laughs> tune out when the characters are trying to be and failing at being funny. And whenever tune back a monster's on the screen, pay attention. <laughs> yeah, that's. Um, and this is another one you want to watch in 4K if you can adjust the settings because then it counters out the. Uh, the wind effect. Like, you're able to see it a little bit better. Um, I was going to ask, what did you think of the Rodan and Mothra designs? I thought they were good. Oh, Mothra, I thought her head was too small. She's the most redesigned out of all of them, I feel. Rodan is shockingly I accurate mean, to his original design. She's adorable and, like, poofy <laughs> and fuzzy yeah. in, like, her original form. And then... Yeah. What, you're going to take fuzzy and adorable and put it into this? It doesn't work. So they had I mean, to, they like... They could have tried. They had to make her edgy <laughs> somehow. <laughs> uh, but no, Godzilla still looks great. They changed his fins to look like they normally do. Uh, it's got a fun final battle that goes on for a while. Uh, yeah, it's still flawed, but I give this one a good... What do you give it? I give it a great. It, a great and good. <laughs> hmm. No mention of the Shobijin. I guess uh, I know a little more about Godzilla than people think. But hey, this isn't a contest. But our next movie is a contest. Because in 2021, the MonsterVerse finally culminated in the battle we were all waiting for. Godzilla vs. Kong. 
These characters first met in 1962's King Kong vs. Godzilla, and it has an interesting genesis. Originally, Willis O'Brien, the animator behind the original King Kong, wanted to do a Kong vs. Frankenstein movie, where he'd square off against a giant Frankenstein monster. He didn't have any luck getting the movie made in the US, and when he took it to international markets, Toho bought the script because they would wanted to make a King Kong movie. Then they rewrote it, pitting him against Godzilla instead of Frankenstein's monster. I'm still holding out hope for that movie one day. Hey, maybe in 2029. Over the years, there were a few attempts at another matchup between Kong and Godzilla, but ultimately it took six decades before they'd finally meet again. So let's check it out. Five years after Ghidorah, something odd happens. Godzilla seemingly turns on humanity, attacking unprovoked. But Apex Cybernetics is working on something to fight back. To power it up though, they need a powerful energy source. And CTO Ren Serizawa, Ishiro's son, has found one. Some kind of energy source which powers the hollow earth, just like the sun sustains earth's surface. To get a hold of it, they turn to the world's foremost hollow earth expert, Dr. Nathan Lind. He warns that getting inside means crossing the gravitational inversion boundary between worlds. His brother tried and it got him killed, crushed under the weight of an entire planet's gravity. But Apex assures him they've built powerful crafts that can handle it. All they need is help finding the vortex and the energy source. For that, Lind has a crazy idea. There's a theory that titans are naturally drawn to their place of origin. If they could put a titan near a vortex, it may lead the way. Nathan heads to Skull Island to see Dr. Eileen Andrews, who watches over Kong. He asks if they can take Kong to Antarctica, near a hollow earth entry point, and let him be their guide. But she fears it'll be dangerous. Iwi folklore tells of an ancient rivalry between Kong and Godzilla. If Kong leaves the island, Godzilla may sense his presence and attack. But, Lind points out, Kong is getting too big for captivity. Maybe in the hollow earth they could find him a real home. Andrews reluctantly agrees, and they load Kong onto a ship. Andrews also brings Gia along. She is an Iwi native who was saved by Kong in a recent storm that wiped out the rest. Then Andrews adopted her. The girl is deaf and helps calm Kong by communicating with him through sign language. Just as Andrews feared, Godzilla detects his rival and attacks. In water where he has the advantage, Godzilla wins the fight, but leaves Kong alive. They travel the rest of the way by air. And sure enough, once they reach Antarctica, Kong leads them to the hollow earth where titans were born. The apex craft survive the gravitational inversion boundary, and Kong leads them to his ancestor's throne room. He picks up an axe which begins to glow, and touches it to the ground, drawing energy from that source. The CEO's daughter and fellow executive, Maya Simmons, wastes no time extracting the powerful material and uploading the analysis to Apex. Eileen shouts that it's the discovery of the millennium. She can't just strip it for parts. The arguing makes Kong angry, which makes him loud, which draws the attention of some hellhawks. Kong helps Eileen, Gia, and Nathan escape, but crushes Simmons' ship in his hand. Meanwhile, Madison Russell has been on a journey of her own. She doesn't believe Godzilla's attacks are unprovoked. They never have been before, and all the attacks have been at Apex facilities, so they are likely the ones provoking him. Podcaster conspiracy theorist Bernie Hayes agrees. So he got himself employed by Apex to investigate them from within. With help from Madison and her sidekick friend Jonah, they find the truth at an Apex cybernetics facility in Hong Kong. The secret weapon they are developing, which needs the Hollow Earth's power, is Mecha Godzilla, and that's not all. They also got a hold of Ghidorah's severed head, which contains great power. The creature had three very long necks, so the heads had to communicate 
telepathically. Apex has tapped into that power, allowing Ren Serizawa to telepathically control Mecha Godzilla. The rival machine activated by Ghidorah's head is what provoked Godzilla. Now it provokes him again and brings him to Hong Kong, which happens to sit above Kong's throne room in the Hollow Earth. Detecting his rival's presence, Godzilla fires his atomic breath through the ground, drawing Kong back to the surface for battle. The battle ends with Kong half dead on the ground. But Godzilla has another battle ahead, because using Maya's analysis of the Hollow Earth energy, Apex has synthesized some of their own, enough to fully activate Mecha Godzilla. But what little of Ghidorah remains in that severed head wrestles control from Serizawa. It kills the CEO, then goes after Godzilla himself. The robot is powerful, and alone, Godzilla might lose. He needs Kong's help, but the ape's heart is slowing down. They need something powerful to restart it, and they realize they have it. The apex craft is powerful enough to reach the hollow earth, and once they land on Kong's chest, they prove it's powerful enough to restart his heart. Kong rises and fights alongside Godzilla. Jonah even lends a hand, spilling whiskey on a control panel at Apex, momentarily disorienting the robot. Soon, the two rivals are victorious over the mechanical imitation. Then, they face each other, until Kong drops his axe. For today, the fight is over. Soon, Kong is returned to his new home in the Hollow Earth, where he's watched over by a monarch outpost, the first of its kind in the Hollow Earth. With a movie titled Godzilla vs. Kong, there's no longer any doubt over what the franchise is trying to accomplish. Godzilla aimed for something a little more serious, Kong Skull Island did the same but also tried to have a little fun. But by now, the movies have crossed fully into spectacle territory, and this movie puts it right in the title. It knows that you are here to see who wins in a fight, Godzilla or King Kong. The question is, how fun and satisfying is that fight? And how well does the movie entertain you while you wait for it? On the question of the fighting, I'd say this movie is pretty successful. Before the final bout, they manage to squeeze in around one pretty early in the movie when they try to ship Kong to Antarctica. It's a bit of a silly setup because after Godzilla attacks, they switch to transport by air, which begs the question, if that was an option, why not go for that option from the start? Water is Godzilla's domain, and yes, you avoided his usual hunting routes, but you know he leaves those routes when he senses a threat. He did that for the Orca last movie, and that's a little machine that makes noise. This is a 335 foot tall ape who happens to be an ancient rival to Godzilla's species. Of course he'll come looking for a fight. But the fight itself is pretty great. Without the Ghidorah Storm turning battles into CGI clouds, this one feels a bit more like it takes place in a real, physical space. Plus, it's just easier to see what's going on, and the setting makes for some interesting choreography. Kong fighting his chains while the boat flips upside down, jumping from one boat to another, or my favorite, when he tosses an airplane at Godzilla, like a paper airplane. In general, I find Titan combat a lot more satisfying when Kong is involved, because with Godzilla, there's a lot of zapping, grappling, exploding, and tail whipping, but with Kong, you get good old fashioned punching. And that's something I can relate to. That's something I can really feel. I feel it more on an emotional level too, because in this situation, Kong is definitely the underdog. You feel bad for him don't want to see him get killed, and want to see how or if he succeeds. Their final battle also lives up to the promise. They fight in Hong Kong, which makes for an amazing battleground. First, it's a visual feast of a city, especially at night filled with neon lights. The buildings give a sense of scale and something for the Titans to interact with. Well, to destroy. And the camera work is creative. You get top down, bottom up, and my favorite, these awesome POV shots. There's also a real progression to the fight. You see Godzilla and Kong each getting hurt as the battle rages, rather than just punch or claw back and forth until one inexplicably wins. That last point is important. There are a couple of things you want from a matchup like this. 
other than a visual thrill ride. You want a clear winner rather than a tie or some other ambiguous cop-out like the original, and you want the winner to be a logical choice, something that comes organically out of the story. In round one, of course Kong lost because he was at a clear disadvantage. They were fighting in the middle of an ocean where Godzilla is way more equipped for battle. Before Godzilla unambiguously wins, there's a quick round two where it seems Kong is triumphant. And again, in that moment, he had the advantage because he surprised Godzilla with a hollow earth energy powered ax. Then round three, there's no home field advantage or secret weapons, just who's stronger. You can see Kong tries to be strategic, using the environment to avoid Godzilla's atomic breath and get on his back. But ultimately, Godzilla is the king of the monsters and he's stronger. Maybe in a rematch where Kong knew the fight was coming and had time to prepare, he could win. Kind of like Batman versus anyone. Of course, you knew the two would have to team up after their fight, and I love the common enemy they chose. Mecha Godzilla, with his more flexible arms compared to Godzilla's more like little T-Rex arms, he can do some of that punching I love, which makes him almost a combination of Godzilla and Kong's strengths, making him the perfect enemy for both. As a machine, there's also just so much detail to take in, like the thrusters which let him throw punches with more force. The Titan battles in this movie are great, the best this series has to offer so far. We'll see how Godzilla x Kong compares toward the end of this video. But what about the rest of the stuff in this movie? Before the final battle in Hong Kong, how well does this movie entertain you while you wait? I'd give it a C-, and that's mathematically derived, because before Hong Kong, Madison, Bernie, or Jonah are on camera for 25 minutes and 29 seconds. So the other part of the story, Lind, Andrews, Gia, and King Kong, makes up 69.02% of the screen time, and that part of the story is way more compelling versus Madison's 30.98%, which falls almost completely flat. So, 69% of pre-Hong Kong is good, but we can bump it up to a C-, minus because Madison's part does include the Ghidorah head and Mecha Godzilla reveals, which were cool. Let's start with the good, Lind, Andrews, and Gia's story. The main thing which makes it stand out against Madison's part of the story is that it has a ton of momentum. From the start, you know you're building toward a couple of things you want to see. One, they want to make the first true voyage into the hollow earth. So we look forward to getting a real look at what's down there. Two, we're warned that when Kong leaves the island, Godzilla will come for him. So we look forward to seeing their smackdown. And while you wait for both, you aren't just left twiddling your thumbs because the story is paced with a steady stream of intrigue. When we first see Kong, he angrily throws a tree branch into the false sky revealing he's being held in captivity and isn't too happy about it. When we're introduced to Nathan Lind, we get something I was hoping to see more of in King of the Monsters, the filmmakers running wild with some of these sci-fi concepts. Here we find out about the gravitational barrier between the surface world and hollow earth, and we find out about essentially an internal sun. Soon, we learn Gia communicates to Kong through sign language, and on the way to Antarctica, we find out that not only does he understand her, but he actually signs back, which is one of our most concrete windows into his level of intelligence. Then there's the first Godzilla brawl, and finally, the Hollow Earth. To be honest, I wasn't too blown away by it. I was kind of hoping it would be a little more bizarre and different from the surface world. But to be fair, it was already established that Skull Island is a decent example of what's in the Hollow Earth, so it wasn't going to look that different. And after seeing so many CGI creatures over the years, my mind is kind of just numb to it. It's got to be really creative and unique to move the needle. But the way gravity reverses between the floor and ceiling of the hollow earth is a cool idea. It reminds me of one of my favorite platformers on the NES, 
Metal Storm. It has this awesome gravity reversal mechanic. It's also fun watching Kong's behavior here because this is all new to him too. He realizes how the gravity here works. And when he leaps from floor to ceiling, there's this big hand statue there to greet him. That's your first hint that Kong species built things. Then we see the throne room and the axe inside it. This is more of the running wild I want to see. The idea that these giant apes built weapons, structures, and had some form of culture is really cool. It's something I look forward to seeing more of in Godzilla x Kong. It's around this time they realize they're in Hong Kong, and the final battle begins. This is a spectacle movie, and from a pure spectacle standpoint, this plot has plenty to offer, and it hands it out at a pace which keeps your eyes on the screen. From a character standpoint, the standouts are Kong himself and his little friend Gia. As with Skull Island, Kong is pretty expressive, but gets a little more to do in this movie and shows a little more range. We see his frustration at captivity, his sadness wanting to find a home, and his pride in reconnecting with his ancestors. I love this moment where he finds the axe, proudly pounds his chest, and then takes a seat on the throne. Gia also has a few powerful moments. When Kong struggles against his chains on the boat, she holds out a finger and Kong meets it, helping to calm him down and he nearly drowns in a fight with Godzilla. She thanks him and calls him friend. There are a few heartwarming and heartbreaking moments like this in the movie, which elevate it slightly, but it's also frustrating because it shows that this movie could have been more than just spectacle if they pushed things further, instead of just giving us a few crumbs. For example, once everyone else learns Kong signs back to Gia, and she's the only one he'll communicate with, it sets up a dilemma, because now suddenly, Gia has a lot of power. There's one moment which hints at the conflict this could create. Once they reach Antarctica, Kong is hesitant, so they need Gia to convince him to go. Lind asks Andrews to ask Gia to tell Kong that maybe he'll find family down there. Lind might be stretching the truth and selling false hope, something Gia may not want to do. So there's an opportunity for dramatic tension between what Lind and others want and what Gia is willing to say to Kong, and what he himself is willing to do. But the moment is brief. Gia tells him he might find family, and Kong goes. Otherwise, their two-way communication is hardly used, even though it's one of the most fascinating reveals in the movie and a great source for dramatic tension. The other main characters, Nathan Lind and Eileen Andrews, are played by talented actors, Alexander Skarsgård and Rebecca Hall, but they really aren't given anything to do, other than provide the necessary exposition and move the plot forward. But there's no real emotional arcs or character development, even though they set up an opportunity for it. Lynn's brother was killed trying to get to the Hollow Earth. So you imagine it's pretty emotional for him to finally get there. He's seeing this new world for himself and his brother, completing the journey he never could. But if you cut out the one line toward the start of the movie where Lind mentions his brother, you'd have no idea he existed because he's a total non-factor after that. By the way, if you want to know the story of Nathan's brother, the storm which overtook Skull Island, and a bunch of other details, you may want to check out my MonsterVerse Timeline video, where the recaps are a lot more detailed and pull in the tie-in comics which explore backstory left out of the movies. One character I have to mention is Maya Simmons, the CEO's daughter. She represents a pet peeve I have with big blockbuster disaster movies. The jerk character, who is only there to get killed by the monster. The most egregious example is probably the babysitter in Jurassic World, who commits the sin of caring more about her upcoming wedding than a couple of brats she has to babysit. And for that, she gets a brutally drawn out execution by Dinosaur. In this movie, Maya is definitely a jerk. She shows very little care for King Kong, but in this movie's reality, remember, most of the world's exposure to Titans is that they all want to kill you, except maybe Godzilla. So I don't think you can hold it against someone for taking some time to warm up to giant monsters. Her other big sin? is doing exactly what they agreed to. Nathan explained up front to Eileen they're heading to the Hollow Earth to get a sample of that energy source. 
When they find it, Maya takes a sample and Eileen freaks out. It's an amazing discovery. You can't strip it for parts. That is the discovery of the millennium. You can't strip it for parts. Hold it. She isn't stripping it for parts. She's just taking a little sample. And by the way, it's already done. It took two seconds. She just needed a little piece of it. And by the way, you're in a strange place filled with monsters. Maybe it's best to relax, get home, and then debate this. Instead, Eileen starts screaming, and admittedly, Maya jumps the gun a bit, telling her men to draw their guns, but hey, it's a tense situation. Anyway, for that, Maya and all the people working for her, just trying to do their jobs, get crushed in Kong's fist. These scenes where movies execute annoying people always make me feel a little gross, but hey, I admit, it's probably just a me problem. As for the Madison part of this movie, it's not good. The characters are generic. There's only one ham-fisted attempt at some emotion and development when Jonah notices Bernie wearing a holster and Bernie is like, oh, this thing? Yeah, this is a flask of some whiskey my wife left me before she died. She was my rock. I also found Madison pretty irritating. This movie tries to endear you to her using a cliche that's become popular, where the protagonist has a loser friend they make fun of incessantly. He steals his brother's car for her, and she's completely ungrateful. My mission, my wheels. My mission, my wheels. And when they meet with Bernie, it doesn't stop. I bet you drink tap water, Jonah. I drink tap water. Yeah, I kind of figured that. You sheep, you loser. Maybe I'm just taking it personally because she tries driving off when he only has one foot in the car, and that's happened to me in real life twice. Anyway, all that aside, there just isn't much going on in their story. Generic characters bumbling around, trying to uncover what's going on at Apex Cybernetics. But unlike the Kong half of this story, where there's a steady stream of reveals to keep you engaged, this one just treads water until finally the Mecha Godzilla and Ghidorah reveal, which, like I said, is cool. The idea that Ghidorah's heads communicated telepathically is an interesting idea, and exactly the sort of pushing the boundaries of imagination I want to see more of. But until that point, there just isn't enough to keep your interest. Actually, this whole part of the story feels tacked on, something I noticed while writing the recap. Recounting the plot, I was completely focused on Kong and everything around him. Then I got to the climax and realized I had to point out, oh, and by the way, here is some stuff these other characters were up to. But in truth, they do not push the plot forward at all. For example, yes, they discover Mechagodzilla, but the rest of the world was going to do that anyway once he challenged Godzilla to a brawl in the middle of Hong Kong. The only moment where they interact with the main story is when Jonah spills Bernie's grief whiskey on the control panel. And somehow that disorients Mechagodzilla for a second, which itself feels pretty absurd. It would be like spilling something on my Bluetooth keyboard and somehow that affects whatever the computer itself was doing at the time. My guess is that they felt pressure to include the Madison character to maintain a connection to the previous movie and because she's the girl from Stranger Things. If they couldn't find an organic way to keep Madison in the movie and give her something to do, I think they would have been better off dropping the B-plot and expanding more on the A-plot. Maybe that way they could have done more focusing on Kong and Gia's relationship. If you wanted to show some of the Apex side of the story anyway, how about this guy, Ren Serizawa, as in Ishiro's son? He's probably in a pretty interesting situation. His dad sacrificed himself for Godzilla, and now Ren is kind of provoking Godzilla. I want to know what's going on with him. But instead, the fact that he's Ishiro's son comes off as basically an Easter egg for people who listen closely. So, am I being hard on this movie? Yes, but only because I liked it a lot more than King of the Monsters, so I see the potential, and I want them to realize that potential. Also, I just realized, once again, this movie feels like two disjointed movies stuck together. Why does the MonsterVerse keep doing that? Castzilla, am I crazy here? What, uh, what do you think about all this? I can't believe you put your money on Gamera. He wasn't even in the movie, Gil. Anyway... All roads led to this, Godzilla versus Kong. Uh, this movie's awesome. I love this movie <laughs> so much. I, oh my God, sometimes I have to rewind the scenes because I just want to watch them again. <laughs> also, yeah. 
I was right. Yes. I was right we all had along. A, we had, if you listen to our podcast, go back in our back catalog. We had a whole contest where the whoever predicted the outcome wrong had to read an apology written by the winner. I wrote an entire, like, what, whole full page, and you only wrote, like, a tiny paragraph? Yeah, I wrote, like, <laughs> a paragraph. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, they were smart to build up to this one. The movie, the movie really, ha- I feel like it has less characters. It's only focused on, like, two teams. There's, like, yeah. Kong team yeah. and Godzilla team. Yeah, team Kong, team. team Godzilla. Yeah, and there's only a few characters in the team that you have yeah, to... Yeah, they don't bother me. No. Nobody bothers me in this movie. No. And um Oh, and then I guess that later they do have like the the bad guys technically. Yeah, but they but, like they're barely there. They're they're there as an excuse for Oh, Mecha- I lie. There is that one dude that really annoys me. Uh he's he's a fun and quirky guy on a uh, team Godzilla, I believe. Oh, the podcaster? Yeah. Yeah, no, that guy was annoying. He's yeah. coming back from the new one. Um I'm kill myself. No, the bad guys kind of exist just for a reason to have Mecha Godzilla. Yes. Uh, but no, this one they had a lot of fun with. Uh, Adam Wingard took the reins on this one. He knew to make it like a tight two-hour movie. Uh, I guess the flaw on that is some of the movie feels disconjointed because uh, they cut out a lot. Like Lance Reddick is, oh, is really high up on the list of the cast, and he has one scene. They cut out the twins from Monarch uh, from the previous film, the mm-hmm. Mothra twins. They cut them out. Um, yeah, there's just awkward editing. Like, Sarazawa's son is in this movie. I don't know if you know this. Maybe I think yeah, I was Gil... going to say, did they even say it? I think Gil might have pointed out. Yeah, they say his name is Sarazawa, and we got confused. And, like, apparently you have to read the novelization because they cut out... I'm a... not doing... Any type <laughs> of thing like that, I'm not doing it. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, there's weird stuff like that, but they knew. They're like, hey, let's just focus on the story enough to be an excuse for them to have three fights and then fight a monster together. Uh, and I think they did pretty much everything right. Uh, I the, love every single fight. The fights are great. You can see them <laughs> clearly. Yeah, but <laughs> just the whole Godzilla's just like I. I just want to be in charge. Um, <laughs> I did all that work in the previous movie. Uh, just, just bow. Like, just, <laughs> but he was messing with him the whole time. Yeah. And then only the uh, what was it? The battle in um, where were they? Um, uh. Hong Kong. Was it Hong Kong? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, it got super serious, and Gus was like, "All right, well, activate alligator mode and starts ripping the crap out of him." Yeah. Uh, the most satisfying thing about this, even though I lost, was there was a clear winner, which a yeah. lot of versus films, when it's two big characters meeting versus films, they kind of always have like a weird ending where it's yeah. like they kind well, of both think won. Of, well, yeah, that's like the um, first two fights technically, yeah. or whatever, because uh, the, there's the boat fight, and then and it's then just um, kind of like oh okay, there's two Hong Kong fights, yeah. yeah. So there's the night, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So there was a clear winner. It's fun. It's action packed. It's really stupid. They've really devolved into like as if you listen to our podcast plugging again. <laughs> Every time they reboot Godzilla, it starts off serious and then devolves into sci-fi fantasy wackiness. And here now there's a magic tunnel that'll take you to Hong Kong. And now there's a planet inside the planet. And Godzilla planet. can also shoot through it all Godzilla the way. Godzilla can and shoot through Godzilla the planet. Godzilla and King Kong can look at each other from like the Earth's crust, basically, in the very top. <laughs> They're flying spaceships into portals. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really ridiculous. What did you think of Mecha Godzilla? That Godzilla was cool. Yeah. Uh, it's basically Ghidorah Reborn. Yeah. They mix they mix all the origins of Mechagodzilla into one. So he's technically an alien. He's technically built off the back of a dead monster. And uh, he's just a robot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Highly enjoyable. I give this one, I mean, on a technical level, like the script level, it's clunky. Whatever. But I give it a great. I give it an awesome. <laughs> What's the difference? It's uh, great, better than great. Great and awesome. <laughs> and the movie introduced us to Doug. He's the best. Remember when we thought he was Manila? We thought he was Manila. That's Godzilla's son in the Showa era. <laughs> Subscribe to our podcast to learn more facts about this. Not to be confused with Godzilla Jr. <laughs> Tony, did you say Gamera? I can't believe you put your money on Gamera. He wasn't even in the movie, Gil. It's pronounced Gamora, and she's part of Marvel, not the MonsterVerse. I would know I did the MCU timeline and the MonsterVerse timeline. Anyway, sometimes these movies feel a little cartoonish. 
Well, let's check out an actual cartoon, the Skull Island Netflix series, which takes place after Kong Skull Island, but before Godzilla. This is 2023's Skull Island. In the early 90s, a few more visitors find their way to Skull Island. It starts with a ship called the Once Upon a Maritime, captained by a man who goes by Cap. He once spotted a monster in the water, and ever since, it's been his life's mission to find another. He's joined by his son Charlie, along with Hero, Hero's son Mike, and their crew. One day, Charlie spots a girl overboard and rescues her. She's slow to trust him or his dad, but they only want to help, which draws them into a mess because apparently there are mercenaries after her who promptly board the ship. She escaped them in a small boat which got taken out by a sea monster, and it's not long before that same monster, a giant squid, takes down their ship. As thanks for the help he gave, Annie rescues Cap from drowning, but most of the others, including Mike's father, die. Mike and Charlie wash ashore what they soon learn is Skull Island. They struggle at first, but get help from unexpected places, like the giant ape which eats the killer crocodile before it can eat them, and Annie, who is strangely adept at killing monsters, not to mention the large killer dog who accompanies her. Soon, Charlie gets to know her and learns her story. She and her father shipwrecked on a nearby island ten years ago. Like this one, it was teeming with monsters. When they were attacked, he fought one of the monsters and killed it but died himself in the process. Then Annie learned her father wasn't the only one protecting someone. The monster left a puppy behind. Both orphaned, the two became fast friends. She named him Dog and they grew up protecting each other. Everything was great until now. A woman showed up with a bunch of men with guns and captured her. As Charlie spends time with Annie, he finds himself falling for her. Elsewhere on the island, Charlie's dad bumps into that woman, Irene, and they strike a deal. He'll help find the girl if she helps find his son. Getting the girl, however, is not as easy as finding her. They also have to contend with her killer dog. When a giant bird carries off one of Irene's men, they figure out how. They lure Annie and her dog into the bird's hunting ground. Then they tranquilize her while the bird carries off the dog. All this happens while Mike and Charlie watch from behind some tall grass. When they spot Charlie's dad with Irene and her mercenaries, they assume he's a captive. So Mike gives himself up as a distraction, giving Charlie a chance to escape and figure out a way to help. Why was Mike so ready to give himself up? It might be because he's dying. When the sea monster attacked their ship, it wounded him badly, something he's kept to himself to keep his friend from worrying. But once he finds out Charlie's dad is okay, he rests, while Irene provides whatever medical attention she can. Charlie, meanwhile, bumps into a native, who chases him into the bird's hunting grounds. Then he gets picked up and brought to the same place as Dog, the top of a tower, where there stands a temple in honor of the giant ape. They scale down the side of the tower and notice some carvings of the ape protecting the island. When they reach the bottom, they see the ape himself, staring sadly at an old medallion. Back at camp, Annie wakes up and isn't too happy about getting shot, which makes Irene's confession even more difficult. She is Annie's mother. She tells Annie about burying an empty coffin ten years ago, and about how fishermen spotted the wreckage of her ship. Once Irene had an idea where Annie might be, she hired the mercenaries and came looking for her. The only reason they took her by force is because they were attacked by a man-eating dog, who ate some of her men. When Charlie returns with Dog, the creature pounces on Irene. But after her mother apologizes for shooting at Annie, and for taking a decade to find her, Annie calls him off. Their relationship is far from repaired, but Annie does decide to stay, and that's progress. Now all that's left is to leave the island, and they have to move fast because Mike needs real medical attention soon. But anyone who tries to leave, will get killed by that giant squid. They have to somehow kill it first. For that, 
Charlie has an idea. The carvings gave him the idea that the ape is this island's protector. What if they steal the medallion he seems to care so much about and use it to bait him into the sea, where he'll bump into the squid, then hopefully win the inevitable fight? Charlie and Annie steal the medallion, and it works. They don't know it, but that medallion belonged to an Iwi native Kong was close with, a native who was killed along with others by that giant squid. As they rush back to the coast, Charlie realizes Dog is too slow with two people on his back. So, he tells Annie she's the coolest girl he ever met. Then, he lets himself fall off Dog's back, leaving Annie to go back alone. That gives them the speed they need, and sure enough, Kong ends up in a fight with the squid. Charlie, meanwhile, falls into a trap, and a native promises to make him pay for what he did to Kong. Back in the water, Kong struggles, but is ultimately victorious. When he rips the squid in half and tosses its remains, he inadvertently causes a large wave, causing Annie to hit her head on a rock. Two weeks later, she wakes up in a hospital, looks out the window at the city, and asks her mom, where am I? Huh. That was a fun and kind of weird show. Fun because it's a classic family adventure that sometimes harkens back to Saturday morning cartoons. You've got kids fighting monsters on a mysterious island along with their giant dog sidekick. But it's weird because it also leans in a more adult direction sometimes, meaning people die left and right, which adds stakes that even as a child I recognized were missing in some of the animation I watched. So this felt like it hit a long-neglected sweet spot. Of course, there are plenty of animated shows with plenty of death. And in America, recently they're becoming more mainstream. Things like Invincible or countless anime series we've imported. But this show has those stakes while retaining the childlike whimsy of a Saturday morning cartoon. Definitely not the first show to do it, but I think it's rare and it was a pleasant surprise. One place the MonsterVerse has struggled is with its characters. In rewatching it all, that's an aspect where Skull Island stands out. The characters are not especially complex or unique, but before you even worry about that, the first step is to make sure we want to watch the characters. Kong Skull Island did that, and so does Skull Island. Huh. Those are kind of confusing titles. Has that ever happened before where there are two entries in a franchise? One has a subtitle and then a follow-up is just that subtitle? That'd be like Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban having a sequel that's just called The Prisoner of Azkaban. Anyway, these characters are likable and relatable. Charlie has been working for his father on his ship, but wants to go to school and meet people. Cap understands that, but also likes how things are now. He doesn't say no, but he doesn't exactly say yes either. I'm sure everyone can relate to that friction with parents. Charlie's friend Mike is also caught between supporting his buddy and not wanting to stop going on adventures with him. And there's my favorite character, Annie. In some ways, she reminds me of Hank Marlowe, probably because she's had a similar experience. But she got stranded as a child. So while Hank was a man out of time, she is a girl out of time who also missed a childhood, which means she's still learning a lot of the basics of human interaction and social cues. For example, Mike partly blames himself for his father's death and all of them getting stranded, because apparently he and his dad heard about Irene hiring people to search for this island, and they took the money without telling Cap. In one scene, Mike freaks out about this. He grabs his head and yells. Annie's response is... What's he doing to his hair? Uh, not now, Annie! It's a kind of dark humor that, again, you wouldn't normally expect from this sort of show, because she's basically indifferent to his grief. But she does also show empathy, and there's a heartwarming moment where she relates over how both of them have lost fathers. Hey, I'm sorry about your dad. I'm sorry about your dad, too. Thanks. Hey, now we're friends. We got stuff in common. Also like Hank, she's made the best out of her situation and retains an enthusiasm that makes her likable. Even Dog, though he can't speak, is a fun character. I like how people assume he's her pet, but they really treat each other more like friends, sometimes to Charlie's detriment. At one point, he falls in a giant ant hole. Ants. 
He wants Dog's help to get out, but Dog doesn't want to help, and Annie can't make him. There's also something inherently satisfying about watching people overcome differences and come together. This show is full of that. Cap and Irene form a tenuous alliance, then bond further once he realizes the obvious truth that the girl she's searching for is her daughter. Charlie and Annie get close, though it's hard to discern how much Annie realizes how much he likes her. Not surprising considering he's the first boy she's spoken to other than Dog in about a decade. Just look at her response to his heroic sacrifice. I want you to know I think you're the coolest girl I've ever met. Okay. I'll see you on the beach! Even Charlie and Dog have to put aside their differences. He refuses to let Charlie ride on his back earlier in the series. But once they're both trapped on that tower, they agree to work together, which of course isn't easy since Dog can't talk. But his ears perk up whenever Charlie says Annie's name, so he works with that and teaches Dog how to scale the tower. This show isn't doing anything groundbreaking or new, but it's repackaging stuff that's universally enjoyable and delivering it through the MonsterVerse. A boy and an animal learning to communicate so they can overcome an obstacle. It never gets old. Then of course there's Irene and Annie, beginning the process of reuniting as mother and daughter. To some extent, I think I'm going easy on this show because it doesn't set its sights too high, but in the end it achieves its goals. It's a fun story that appealed to my inner child. Though I was curious what others had to say about it, and the worst review comes from CNN, where they say, The series that washes ashore via Netflix is mostly aimed at adults, just not particularly well. That might be some of the disconnect, because this did not feel aimed at adults to me. It does have death and adds some stakes often missing in children's shows, but I thought it was pretty clearly aimed at teens, maybe occupying a similar young adult space as something like Hunger Games. Though the storytelling in this show is simpler, and like I said, does have Saturday morning cartoon vibes, so it almost feels like it's aiming for an even younger audience. It skirts a weird line, but never did I think it was aimed at adults. Maybe it's one of those shows that's good for a kid who you think is mature enough to handle it. If I have any complaints about the show, it'd mostly be on two fronts. One, it hints at some interpersonal conflicts I mentioned, which never really go anywhere satisfying. Charlie wanting to go to college and stop these adventures doesn't play much of a role, especially since he's separated from his dad most of the time. And Mike's admission that he and his father took money from Irene just feels weird. Like, how does Cap think they funded the voyage? Why was Hero so desperate for the money? Mike makes it seem like it was partly because they wanted a fun trip with Charlie before he abandons them for school, which just feels really childish. And even if Cap is against taking private money, it also just doesn't feel like that big a deal because it put them in danger, but their whole mission is looking for giant monsters. So danger kind of comes with the territory. It also just doesn't really go anywhere, because who can hold it against Mike after he lost his father? Obviously, one issue overrides the other. On that front, it also felt like the character was never properly grieved, especially by Cap. If it were a more adult show, that's definitely something I'd have needed to see more of. And of course, there's the fact that the story ends with so little resolution. I get they're setting up for a potential season two, already written, but not officially renewed or canceled yet. But so much is left open. Is Mike okay? Where's Dog? How's Charlie doing? Did Cap stay behind to keep looking for Charlie or did he come home? Some amount of cliffhangers can be good, but for me, this went a little too far. All right, let's turn it over to Tony and Johanna. Maybe this is one where I went a little too easy on the show. Let's find out. Wow, Gil, that was a very informative review of, so the, detailed. of the Netflix show Skull Island. We wish we could give you our review of Skull Island, but we forgot to watch it for this video. Oops. <laughs> so we'll just take your word for it, Gil. Subscribe to our show. We'll get to it eventually. We'll get to it eventually. We promise to review it. We dropped the ball on this one. <laughs> Oops. I blame you. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. What? 
No, no, we can't not have your review. That would make the video incomplete. It, it would lose all credibility. Maybe I can, maybe I can just make something up. Hello, Johanna. Hello, Tony. So, Skull Island. I did not watch this show because cartoons are for children. What about you, Johanna? Are you a child who watched a silly cartoon? You're such an idiot, Tony. Wow, even in my imagination, Tony fails me. Well, it's not my imagination that next up, we're talking about the first ever live action TV series to feature Godzilla. Well, technically not the first. Toho made Zone Fighter in 1973, an Ultraman style show where Godzilla occasionally showed up. And his appearances were apparently considered in continuity with the movies at the time. Anyway, this is the first American TV series to feature Godzilla, and it fills a lot of the gaps between movies partly taking place in the 50s at the start of Monarch, and partly in 2015, shortly after Godzilla. Let's check it out. In 2014, Godzilla emerged in San Francisco and inadvertently destroyed the Golden Gate Bridge. Ford and L's son was lucky to survive, but some weren't. One teacher, Kate Randa, had to watch a busload of her students fall into San Francisco Bay. A week later, her father Hiroshi abandoned her and her mother, saying there's something he needs to do. And a week after that, his bush plane disappeared in Alaska. After the string of heartbreaks, she and her mother find something strange in Hiroshi's drawer, a key and lease to an apartment in Tokyo. She heads to that apartment, and inside it finds a second family, a mother and her son, Kentaro. Kate and her apparent half-brother head to Hiroshi's office and find more strange things. Inside a hidden safe, a bag with a symbol on it, which Kate recognizes. People wearing it were on the bridge after Godzilla. They'll soon learn it's the symbol for Monarch, a company their father works for, and the bag is filled with research from Bill Randa, something he tossed off the edge of Skull Island before his death, which was retrieved by fishermen only last year. The research is all on old tech, so they recruit someone who knows old tech, Kentaro's ex, May. She cracks the encrypted research to reveal redacted documents, a map, and some photos, including one of their grandmother Keiko standing in Godzilla's footprint. It could be the beginning of a globe-trotting adventure, but Kate isn't interested, especially after learning her father was cheating on her mother for years. For Kate, the journey is over. She prepares to head home, until she's intercepted by Tim and Michelle, agents of Monarch, alerted by them cracking the encryption. Kate escapes their grasp, and by the time she gets to May's place, finds the agents are already there. So May and Kate sneak off together. At Kentaro's home, the boy asks his mother about a photo he found in his father's things. It's someone Hiroshi called Uncle Lee. When the Monarch agents arrive demanding Kentaro hand over Bill's research, his mother quietly hands him the photo of Lee, a silent message to go find him, He'll know what to do. Kentaro pretends he's going to grab Bill's research, but instead escapes. He reconvenes with Kate and May, then the three of them find Lee Shaw at a retirement home. But the ankle bracelet and cameras make it clear he is Monarch's prisoner. Lee tells them he doesn't believe Hiroshi is dead, and he'd like to find him. They escape together, and with help from Lee's pilot friend, Duho, they head to Alaska, where they find Hiroshi's bush plane destroyed. But it didn't crash. Something destroyed it after it landed, and that something soon appears, killing Duho while freezing him and their plane solid with a cold breath. Stranded, Kate, May, Kentaro, and Lee have little time to find a way out. Either the cold will kill them, or that Titan will. Soon, the group splinters when they can't decide what to do. Kentaro spotted a man-made structure on the way in, but no one else saw it, and they can't know if he's mistaken or not. So, he heads off on his own, while the others head for a bright light in the distance. Kentaro does find a structure, and in it, 
pencil shavings left behind by Hiroshi, he was here, and Kentaro finds a radio, which he uses to call for rescue, just in time because the rescue copter finds Kate, May, and Lee running from the cold breathing titan. On the way out, they spot the source of that bright light, a glowing hole in the ground. The helicopter takes them to a monarch outpost, where each of them is interrogated. Michelle offers May a deal. Michelle found a bunch of passports with different identities in May's things. Clearly, she is on the run from something. If May helps Michelle, Michelle can pull some strings to get her a clean slate. For now, May refuses. And soon, Tim convinces his superior Verdugo to let the kids go. Kate and Kentaro's father is Hiroshi Randa, son of Keiko and Bill Randa, who were there at the founding of Monarch, just like Lee Shaw. Perhaps Kate and Kentaro could carry on the Randa legacy. So they let them go, but will keep monitoring them from a distance. The three kids head to Hiroshi's other office, where overlaying one map on another points where he's going next, the Sahara Desert. Lee, meanwhile, is still under interrogation by Verdugo, but all she gets from him is a lecture about how useless Monarch has been since its founding. They had 60 years to prepare for Godzilla and the Muto's emergence, but the best plan they could come up with was let them fight. It's time for Monarch to be proactive against monsters. Verdugo is unmoved by his words, but outside the interrogation room, they seem to resonate with Michelle. For her, it's personal. She lost her sister, Sandra Brody, when the Japanese plant collapsed in 99. So when Lee is taken for transport, Michelle breaks him free, and she knows where the kids are going next, because May told her in exchange for that clean slate. They find them at Kate's mom's house, and at Lee's insistence Michelle is on their side, they all head to the Sahara Desert together. Where they spot Hiroshi in the distance, with a strange machine on his pickup truck. He frantically waves for them to leave, just before Godzilla shows up. They all barely survive the encounter, and before the Titan leaves, he looks at Kate with something in his eyes. Intelligence and recognition. Afterward, Hiroshi is gone, and Kate disagrees with Lee on what to do next. Lee insists on following Godzilla. Why? Kate asks. They can't stop the Titan, but that isn't what Lee wants to do. He wants to help Godzilla. They can come with him and he'll explain everything, or they can go their separate ways. Kate opts for the latter. But when they get back home, May goes missing. When Tim finds Kate and Kentaro, they agree to help him figure out what Lee Shaw is up to if he helps them find May. And they do, at a company called Applied Experimental Technologies. It seems her past has finally caught up with her. Back when May went by her real name, Cora, she worked for AET, but soon discovered they were performing unethical experiments on animals to develop neural interface units. So she erased their research and went on the run. Now they're making her an offer. Either they call the police and have her arrested, or May continues working with Monarch, but as their spy, because they would love to upgrade from animal research to Titan research. May refuses, which means she'll have to face the authorities. But Kate and Kentaro strike a deal of their own. Verdugo agrees to pull some strings and have May set free, in exchange for Kate and Kentaro's help finding Lee. And how did Verdugo get AET to let May go? She struck a deal, providing AET access to data on Titans. Data that in the next seven years will help them build Mechagodzilla under a new name, Apex Cybernetics. Lee and Michelle, meanwhile, have begun their crusade. It turns out Hiroshi's map points to various passageways to the Hollow Earth. Lee would like to close them all, starting with the one in Alaska, the source of that bright light. So, he and Michelle blow it up. Kate and the others begin their search for Lee at an old Monarch field office, where some files give her the idea that Lee may have loved her grandmother, Keiko, so the next place he'll go on Hiroshi's map is probably the place where he lost her, Kazakhstan, a place where he feels there's a chance for redemption. How did he lose her there? 
It's a long story which begins in 1952, when Lee was an army lieutenant, which would make him about 90 in 2014, yet he seems more like 70. How could that be? That's also part of the long story. He's assigned to escort Dr. Keiko Mura on a mission in the Philippines, where they bump into Billy Randa, who is looking for the same thing as her, the truth. For her, it's scientific research to find the source of some strange radiation readings. But for him, it's a crusade, because he knows where the radiation is likely coming from, a dragon, the same one which sank the USS Lawton, despite official reports it was taken down by an enemy attack in World War II. Billy intends on proving the truth, and soon they find the ship, along with the Ion Dragon who sank it. With Lee's help, they survive the encounter. In 1954, Lee asks the military for more funding to expand their monster searching operations. They lend him 150 pounds of uranium to lure another titan, but the military has less interest in learning about monsters and more interest in killing them. So when the uranium attracts a titan named Godzilla, they blow him up. But only a year later, Lee, Keiko, and Billy discover that he's still alive. In Japan, they find a man who's built a gamma radiation simulator which attracts Titan. A Titan phone, just like the one Hiroshi will have on his pickup truck a few decades later. And when he turns the Titan phone on, Godzilla shows up. But for Lee, it's a disappointing trip. He skipped an important meeting to be there because he wanted to be with Keiko. They've been falling for each other, but she rejects his advances. She knows their work is too important, and if they fall in love, it'll make it hard to prioritize it. Today is proof of that. Lee skipped an important meeting for romance, and in his absence, Monarch was handed off to someone else, who seems intent on shutting it down. After all, the military believes they killed Godzilla a couple years ago, and since then, Monarch hasn't produced any hard evidence of other Titans out there. They could reveal Godzilla is still alive, but Keiko and Billy worry the military will just try to kill him again. So, Billy and Keiko get to work, trying to find something that will prove Monarch's worth. They map out every Titan sighting, and Billy gets an idea how they so quickly move around the globe. That's when he comes up with a theory of a hollow Earth. And that isn't the only development. Working closely, the two are also falling in love. And Billy learns that Keiko is a widow with a son named Hiroshi. She's been raising him alone, but Billy assures her that now she doesn't have to. Meanwhile, Lee saves Monarch by playing that card they've been keeping close to the chest. He reveals to General Puckett that Godzilla is alive. So of course, Monarch has to remain active. Over the next five years, Billy becomes a father to Hiroshi, and soon a single father. In Kazakhstan, Billy, Keiko, and Lee study some titan eggs. When the ground becomes unstable and the eggs hatch, Keiko falls into the swarm of insectoids. Three years after that, in 1962, Lee joins a small team on the first attempted trip into Billy's theorized hollow earth. Only titans can get through the vortex, so they build a small craft, use the titan phone to call a titan, it comes to the surface and then the craft follows it back in. It all goes as planned at first, but after the craft disappears, the vortex implodes and Lee is seemingly lost. In truth, he finds himself in Axis Mundi, a place that connects the surface and the hollow earth. Between their crash landing and a titan attack, Lee is the only survivor. After a week there, he gets sucked into a vortex and dropped in the woods, only to wake in a hospital. In 1982. It seems the gravitational distortion in Axis Mundi causes time to pass differently. For him, it's been a week, but on the surface, it's been 20 years. A grown Hiroshi greets him in the hospital, and after losing both his parents, Bill and Keiko, to Titans, he's grown bitter. To keep Monarch and Lee's experience secret, he has him thrown into that retirement home, which doubles as a prison. Lee grew old in that retirement home, and now in 2014, finally returns to Kazakhstan to blow up the hollow earth entryway there. 
until Kate, Tim, and the others show up to stop him. He explains to Kate why he's doing all this and what he meant by helping Godzilla. Godzilla is a thinking creature. Kate saw it when she looked in his eyes. And Godzilla knows that Titans and humans have to remain separate. Titans in the hollow earth, humans on the surface. So Lee is helping him out by shutting all the passageways between them. When he sets the bombs to detonate, chaos ensues. May falls into the vortex. Then Kate and Lee goes with her to protect her. Once again, Lee finds himself in Axis Mundi and soon gets his chance at redemption. Because Keiko Randa is still there. She's been alive all this time. To Keiko, it's been 57 days, but on the surface, 56 years. In that time, her husband died, driven to obsession in the wake of her apparent death. Lee grew old, and her son grew up without a mother. Together, they find a way out. The gamma radiation simulator and the vessel Lee took in 1962 are both here, so they decide to leave the way he came in. They call for a titan, and the ion dragon comes. They prepare to follow it home until a wire comes loose. For Lee, that's the moment of redemption. He leaps from the vessel to fix that wire as the dragon approaches. He's going to run out of time until Godzilla shows up and buys him the time he needs. Lee connects the wire as the vessel leaves. He jumps after it and Keiko grabs his hand. But Lee knows he's too much weight. He thanks her for everything and lets go. Lee Shaw does not make it home. But he does find absolution, because Kate, May, and Keiko get through that portal, and they do make it home. Though things have changed. Little time has passed for them, but on the surface, it's been two years. In that time, Hiroshi, Tim, and Kentaro had few options for the help they needed when Monarch refused to help find their friends. In their desperation, they turned to May's old company, AET, which now goes by Apex Cybernetics. That's where they are now, one of their research centers on Skull Island, and King Kong is nearby. His proximity sets off an alarm, and the group runs inside for cover. Like I mentioned in the recap, that is the same Apex Cybernetics, which goes on to build Mecha Godzilla seven years later. Monarch ends in 2017, and Godzilla vs. Kong happens in 2024. This Apex Cybernetics reveal speaks to a challenge faced by this show. In the new era of franchises spanning mediums yet remaining connected in a cinematic universe, writers have to find a way to make compelling shows which aren't required viewing for the relevant film series. Star Wars and the MCU have been facing this challenge, and now the MonsterVerse does too. Often, the challenge is handled through one-way references. TV shows can feel connected to movies by referencing them or elaborating on them, like providing backstory on the origins of Apex Cybernetics. But usually, the reverse doesn't happen where something is introduced on TV and carried over into movies. This poses a challenge, because especially in a franchise that emphasizes spectacle over character, what keeps you watching is amazing and thrilling visuals, something limited on a TV budget, though impressively done in Monarch when it's sparingly used. Or the other thing which holds our attention is a sense of discovery. The MonsterVerse is a world teeming with mystery, What's in the Hollow Earth? How did humans coexist with Titans in ancient times? How intelligent is Kong? Can he defeat Godzilla? What other Titans are out there? This sense of discovery is also limited in a TV series, because we know the biggest reveals have to be saved for the movies. So, what do you do? The Skull Island animated series handles the issue by separating itself from the movies. It could easily be an independent story involving a reimagining of Kong with no connections to a broader monsterverse. It wasn't about big reveals or spectacle. Instead, it was a simple adventure survival story. And it told the story with a tried and true formula. Give us a handful of likable characters who must overcome differences and work together in a life-threatening situation. Monarch Legacy of Monsters does a bit of this, but also leans pretty heavily on mystery. Like the first act of 2014's Godzilla, it takes what is known to us and makes it unknown to the characters. 
To Kate, May, and Kentaro, Monarch is a mysterious organization. To us, it's not. We know who they are and what they do. To Billy, Lee, and Keiko, the Hollow Earth is a mysterious and new theory. To us, it's not. We've already seen Skull Island, which we're told is similar to the Hollow Earth. We saw Godzilla's temple in King of the Monsters. And three years ago, when Godzilla vs. Kong came out, we saw the Hollow Earth itself. The show does also try to craft a few of its own mysteries. What is Hiroshi up to? What is Lee's plan? And why is Lee 20 years younger than he should be? The last question is the one which gets the most satisfying answer. The idea of gravitational distortion causing time to work differently in Access Monday is an interesting one, a satisfying resolution to the question, and more importantly, it has great emotional payoff. Lee's reunion with Keiko is probably my favorite scene in the whole series, and we'll talk about it more in a bit. The first question, what is Hiroshi up to, is less satisfying, and overall, less captivating. The Lee question is almost automatically interesting because it poses something impossible. Why is he the wrong age? So naturally we're curious. But regarding Hiroshi, the show doesn't give us enough reason to get invested in that question. Our first introduction to the guy is that he's kind of a scumbag. He has two families he's kept secret from each other, so that's a knock against him. And in the flashback from episode one, we learn that he abandoned his daughter at the lowest point of her life. It's hard to wrap your head around how incredibly awful it must be as a teacher to watch a bunch of your students die and not be able to do anything about it. It's days after this tragedy that Hiroshi chooses to run away with no indication he'll ever come back, and no hint as to why he has to go. And he doesn't even have the courage to look his wife in the eyes to tell her he sends his daughter to do his dirty work instead, forgetting about his other wife, who he doesn't send any kind of word to. From the start, I hated this character, so on a personal level, I found it hard to care why he ran off, because he strikes me as the dad who leaves for a pack of cigarettes and never comes back anyway. To get me interested, the show would need to provide a hint that when I find out why he's on the run, the answer will be satisfying. But it doesn't really do that either, other than revealing he works for Monarch, which isn't inherently compelling since we've already been on the inside of Monarch for a few movies. And in the end, once his motivations are revealed, sure enough, they aren't that interesting. He was just trying to prove a theory we've already seen proven several times over, the Hollow Earth. It's also not clear why proving the Hollow Earth real necessitates never seeing his family again. Why not spare them the heartbreak and say, hey, I have to take a work trip for the next couple of months. I mean, how long does it take to fly to Alaska and take a photo of the obvious portal in the ground? Even if Verdugo dismisses it like, we study monsters, not vortexes. You show that photo to enough people at Monarch, someone will say, yeah, we should probably look into that. And with all the data they've collected, I'm sure he could correlate the location of the portals with Titan appearances, and there's pretty compelling evidence to prove his father's theory. His whole crusade hinges on this absurd conceit. The Hollow Earth theory is such heresy at Monarch that there is absolutely no way Hiroshi can study it from within the organization. When General Puckett saw the impression of Godzilla's footprint in the 50s, his first question was how can something this big walk around without being seen? That mystery is what led Billy to the Hollow Earth theory. Yet we have to believe that Monarch lets that question stand as a mystery for decades and never investigates the only credible theory to explain it. Why? Because this crazy talk. Who would believe such a thing? A hollow earth? Billy was nuts. That's the explanation they give repeatedly. It's considered a crackpot theory and is not ever to be considered. Despite the fact that Lee Shaw has been there, and even if you think he's crazy or his testimony flawed, there's no question he went somewhere strange considering he disappeared for 20 years and came back the same age. Plus, they have a Titan phone. There is zero chance Monarch and the military would just let that lie there. If not for scientific research, then for its potential as a weapon. Just imagine activating it in an enemy country. Then when Titans trample them, you have plausible deniability. Who would believe you have control over Godzilla? And when they experiment with that Titan phone, they'll naturally ask, when we turn it on and Titans show up, 
Where are they coming from? And of course, that would point to the rifts. You can keep poking holes, but the broader point is that Billy and Keiko gained so much insight into Titans in the span of a few years with limited resources. I just can't get myself to a place where I believe Monarch has done essentially nothing since then. I think the conflict between Lee and Monarch makes sense. There is a debate to be had over taking a more proactive or reactive approach to Titans. But when Monarch isn't just reactive or somewhat passive, but literally doing nothing, really more than doing nothing, actively discouraging research into an incredibly important topic, that takes what could be a real interesting conflict and turns it into a cartoon where Monarch is obviously and unrealistically incorrect in their approach. There's one part that captures it perfectly and it's almost comical. While Keiko is trapped in Access Monday, she gets a hold of the Titan phone and reverse engineers it to send out a distress call. At Monarch, they pick it up and Tim takes it to Verdugo, but she doesn't care. What about the signal? It is not our priority right now. Some, some... The possibility of a survivor in the Hollow Earth is not a priority because they're seeing gamma spikes around the world, similar to ones that appeared before G-Day. So there could be another emergence around the corner. I don't think anyone would disagree with the order of priorities, but to claim that she literally cannot spare a single resource on exploring that incredibly important avenue is insane, especially when we have not seen Monarch accomplish anything of value, and there's no hint they're doing anything to prepare for that possible emergence other than staring at computers. That's Lee's whole point. They do nothing. But where his point of view should be an exaggeration, it seems to be literal, which, like I said, makes the world feel more cartoon than real. All that to say, this show does not do a great job as a mystery story. But how about as a drama and adventure? To answer that, we have to split the show in two. There's the past storyline following a young Lee, Keiko, and Billy. Then there's the 2015 storyline following Kate, May, and Hiroshi. Both are quite different and succeed to varying degrees before fully colliding in the final episodes of the show. Personally, I really enjoyed the past storyline. Like I said, when mystery is off the table, we're more dependent on getting invested in the characters. Usually that comes down to either liking the characters, finding them interesting, or some combination of the two. If you're talking about an anti-hero or villain, like a Joker, you might depend more on interesting. I might not like Arthur Fleck or Walter White, but they're intriguing and hard to look away from. And then comes empathy. If we understand and feel someone's desires, goals, or plight, we can feel their journey. But if we don't want to spend time with that character at all, it's harder to reach the point of empathy. And I liked Keiko, Billy, and Lee. I wanted to spend time with them. Keiko's passion for discovering and understanding nature is infectious. Her ability to take control and assert herself in the face of adversity, thanks to being a woman and Japanese at that in the 50s, is admirable. Billy shares a similar passion, and doubly so, because for him it's personal. He needs to prove what really killed his friends on the Lawton. But he doesn't wear it like a crucible. He isn't miserably going along on a self-imposed mission. He also enjoys the journey, and that too is admirable. And then Lee. He's good at his job and dedicated to it. He's loyal to the army, but not blindly so. He sees the importance of what Billy and Keiko are doing, and it's endearing to watch the lengths he goes to protect them. The characters are sometimes at odds with each other, especially when Lee is caught between loyalty to the army and loyalty to these eggheads. But the conflict never turns bitter, and it's satisfying to watch the three of them build a strong friendship, strong enough to withstand heartbreak when Keiko chooses Billy over Lee. I cared about these characters and enjoyed their entire journey, even if I knew where it was going to some extent. We know how Billy dies, and we know the results of their love triangle, but the strength of the characters and the fun of watching them create Monarch overcame that foreknowledge. On the other hand, the 2015 storyline. They chose to go a different way with that one. There is little work done by the story to make us like Kate, May, or Kentaro. We start the first episode with Kate. We know she lost her father and she's in Japan to settle some affairs. So we don't know much yet. Then she gets on the phone with her mom 
And it's pretty mean to her. You said you'd call when you landed. Yeah, and I just landed. Yeah, two hours ago. Kate, I've been waiting. Glad to get their immigrations and customs. Get a cab. Oh, God. So what, you're there now? I'm here. And? And what, Mom? You think he'll just be sitting here waiting for someone to bring him home? Then she finds her second family and we meet Kentaro, who is quite upset at the revelation, but especially upset at the implication their dad might not be a great guy. And inexplicably, he thinks he can convince Kate otherwise by bringing her to their dad's office. You think our father was so bad? I want to show you something. I can't even follow the logic here. Kentaro has no idea what his father did for work, other than software for satellites. Why in the world does he think showing Kate some maps will make her believe he was a good man? And why does he assume that she doesn't already know the little he does about what Hiroshi did for work? So our introduction to these characters is that they're bitter and not the brightest. Then we get an introduction to the sort of adventure they'll be going on because we get their first puzzle, unlocking Hiroshi's safe. And it's one of those cliche moments where a character is able to guess the password. Your birth month, my day, your mother's month, my mom's day. Contrast that to Billy and Keiko in 1952, episode 2. Their puzzle is finding the source of strange radiation. She approaches it scientifically while he looks to folklore. You know, the people of these mountains, they have an oral tradition about a dragon that carves a path of fire across the sky. Mm. Or maybe a path of ionizing radiation. Combining the two approaches gives them answers. That's cool. And it shows how two mentalities can bring something different to the table for a more complete picture. Or you can watch a couple of miserable kids combine random elements from different birthdays to open a safe. It may seem unfair to complain about their bitterness, because of course it's entirely understandable and justifiable. But like I said earlier, in my view, that understanding is secondary to the first question. Do you even want to spend time with these characters to begin with? For me, the answer was no, especially in comparison to the flashbacks, which were a lot more enjoyable. Now, you can tell a story about unhappy characters, but it's challenging and it's usually balanced by other traits that make the character interesting or entertaining. Think of Dr. House. He was miserable, but we loved spending time with him because he was intelligent and funny. Saul Goodman, scumbag lawyer, but also hilarious. Arthur Fleck, horrible, but also fascinating. In an ensemble cast, you have some leeway, because while Kate is suffering the aftermath of a tragedy, the other characters can be a counterbalance, but instead they double down by making Kentaro just as bitter as her. Then we're introduced to a third character, May, who is also miserable, and Kentaro's ex, so the two feed off each other's negativity to multiply the bitterness. With these characters, the present started to feel claustrophobic, and I just wanted to get back to the past. Then came the crushing disappointment of episode 4, when you realize not every episode will show you that past. This episode instead flashed back to May and Kentaro's meeting, and guess what? They were both miserable back then too. May because she's on the run after trying to take down AET, and Kentaro because he's an artist but upset that the people paying for his art only like some of his art, and they don't pay for the other art that he's really passionate about. Some of my animus might be personal, because I remember back before YouTube when I was under a lot of stress, 16-hour days, if I saw a kid getting paid to make art, complaining that he doesn't get paid for all the art he makes, I, you know, that, I mean, that'd be pretty annoying. Imagine if you heard me complaining, like, Oh god, I gotta watch all the Godzilla movies next week and get paid for it. These flashbacks were also disappointing because they answer questions that I think most of us didn't have. By this point, the show has done little to endear us to Kentaro and May or get us interested in them. And there's nothing inherently compelling about a couple of people in their 20s who broke up. If I meet two people who broke up and are forced together by circumstance, if they're bitter about it, my first inclination is to walk away not sit down and listen to their whole backstory, because it's unsurprising and familiar. No one's thinking, whoa, whoa, two damaged people in their 20s went out a few times and broke up? What? Tell me everything. Episode four is kind of the pinnacle that shows just how unpleasant these characters are, because as soon as things get tough, 
they're at each other's throats. Trading barbs or insults can be fun. Here's an example of that in the past storyline. When Lee gets them funding from the military, Billy almost embarrasses them by sharing his theory of Titans teleporting around the world. How does something this big walk around without being seen? Well, I'm leaning towards teleportation. We have a number of working theories, sir. Afterward, he proclaims that he's not gonna bite his tongue just to get support from a bunch of gun-toting Neanderthals. This is a voyage of discovery. So I'm not gonna bite my tongue just to get support from a bunch of gun-toting Neanderthals. Afterward, Keiko and Lee talk. You know how he is. I do. If it wasn't for you, neither of us would be here. And that is not a theory, that's a fact. So you are saying that there is a place for gun-toting Neanderthals. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See, there's some conflict, a bit of a fight, but Lee can be playful with it and call himself a Neanderthal. Or you can have this. Kentaro shoots a flare to try and hit the Titan and, and save everyone, but he misses. Nice shooting, Tex. At least I tried. <sighs> you could have got killed, you idiot. Quiet. It's a great example of the two different approaches. Lee tries to be a little playful and at least calls him Tex. Meanwhile, May just goes with a classic, you idiot. Then she steps in a puddle and things get worse. <sighs> May, you good? Uh, am I good? I'm gonna die of hypothermia. Are you happy we came? You still think it's out there? Hell if I know. Let me show what, what happened to your centuries of experience. It's a titan. May, is it because you're pissed at me? No, this has nothing to do with you. This is about me freezing to death. I'm trying. Oh, you obstinate asshole. Oh, what, you wanna die to prove a point? Do you? Stop. No. Stop, please, stop. And as hypothermia sets in, May tells Kate she might have to leave her behind. It's self-sacrifice, not wanting to slow your friend down, and I'm empathetic to that, but then she goes a step further. Yes, and if the time comes, you ditch him too. Ditch the one guy with any real field experience, who at least has some idea of what they should do and is trying to be proactive, not to mention he's the most and maybe only likable character in the present timeline. So hearing a main character casually tell another to leave him behind for basically no reason doesn't help with likability. This show seems to think that insulting people is supremely entertaining because it does it constantly. Like I said, it can be entertaining if it's done cleverly, in a mutual busting chops sort of way. In the 50s storyline, that's exactly how it's done. But in the present, it always seems bitter and mean-spirited. You need friends. I have friends. Not internet friends. When Kurt Russell's character, the older Lee Shaw, first showed up in episode two, he was such a bright spot. After two episodes of these miserable characters wandering around, finally watching someone crack a smile was a relief. Russell brings such a natural charisma that helps to warm up the present storyline and bring it closer in tone to the past story. But as a singular character, he can only do so much. It's worth mentioning here the brilliant choice of casting Kurt and his real-life son Wyatt Russell in the same role. Both do a great job with the character, and like I said earlier, it does enable some great moments in the story, having an aged character that truly feels like an aged character. Anyway, I feel like I should move on from complaining about Kate, May, and Kentaro, but I just have to point out a couple more things. Episode five is when Kate and Kentaro finally start getting along, but they do it at the worst possible moment. To get to Hiroshi's other office in San Francisco, they have to sneak into a quarantine zone. Inside the quarantine zone, they have to keep quiet and avoid getting seen. Were you not listening? They shoot looters. At one point, they almost get spotted, but manage to trick the guards and escape. Literally 40 seconds later, this happens. You wanna know a good song? Tansuni go. Tansuni go. Where the fuck you? Morts, 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 poninki, poninki. Sankaki no himitsune. Ose dagenai yo. Done. And I'm not being paranoid, because less than 60 seconds after that, we see there were actually guards right around the corner. Sometimes the flashbacks are also so underdeveloped, it feels a lot more like telling rather than showing. This same episode reveals through flashback that Kate was in a relationship, but had a hard time committing to her girlfriend who wanted them to move in together. 
A few issues with these flashbacks. One, it's impossible to get invested in the relationship because her girlfriend Danny has literally 2.5 minutes of screen time. The flashback also reveals that Kate was cheating, sleeping with another girl when she was supposed to meet up with Danny. For a character I'm already having a hard time connecting with, revealing that she betrayed someone in a similar way that her father betrayed both his wives and kids really didn't help especially when in both cases, there's so little exploration of what drove them to that behavior, so there isn't even a shot at empathy. Hiroshi just gets annoyed when Kintaro asks him why he did it, and admits there's no answer. The flashbacks are meant to connect us more with the characters, but they often had the opposite effect for me. Take Mei, for instance. In episode 7, we find out why she's on the run. She found out the company she works for was doing unethical experiments on chimps. Her solution? Delete their research. What exactly did that accomplish? AET is still experimenting on those chimps, and if anything, they'll probably start torturing more of them to try and catch up after Mei's setback. Just like Hiroshi, everyone seems to go from 0 to 11 without trying anything in between or sensible first. We find out Hiroshi was exiled from Monarch after trying to repurpose satellites to track gamma rays on Earth rather than space. Did he try anything else to convince them of the Hollow Earth theory before commandeering satellites and going on the run? Like pointing at Lee, for example, and saying, Hey, isn't it weird this guy didn't age for 20 years? Or maybe this was all an excuse to abandon his families because he was just sick of leading the double life. He went to his boss and asked, Hey, can we talk about Hollow Earth? Eh, not right now. Fine, I'm abandoning my families! Huh? Just like May, whatever they were doing to those chimps was probably illegal, so why not try being a whistleblower? If the proper authorities don't work, maybe leak the info publicly. All of that might fail. But you definitely try that before doing something that accomplishes nothing other than forcing you to go on the run and abandon your family for two years. Unless she was also looking for an excuse. Hey, what kind of research do we do here? Oh, we're working on neural interface with chimps. What? I'M ABANDONING MY FAMILY! Huh? The show also sometimes suffers from resolving conflicts way too quick and easily. The same way sitcoms fix everything by the end of an episode. At one point, May betrays her friends by giving up their location, hoping Michelle will get her a clean slate. And when Kate finds out May betrayed them, she's pissed. So by the end of episode 7, you have these open threats. May is on the run. May hasn't seen her family in a couple years. May had a falling out with Kate and Kentaro. Oh, and on top of that, Tim tries to help get May out of AET's clutches by setting off a false Titan alarm, sending the public into a panic. So now, the public wants answers. In the span of literally five minutes, the following things happen to wrap up the episode in a neat bow. May gives herself up and agrees to be arrested for her actions. Kate and Kentaro ask Verdugo to pull strings to get her freed. May is released without consequences after a monologue about taking responsibility for her actions. Then she reunites with her family. Then she reunites with Kate and Kentaro, who forgive her. Then Tim suggests to Verdugo that rather than do some PR to cover up the false Titan alarm, she go public with Monarch. And by the way, if Monarch wants to be secret, why do they wear the symbol when they're out in front of the public? Verdugo agrees with Tim and gives a press conference telling the world all about Monarch. All that in five minutes. It feels really contrived, like so much of the present storyline, going all the way back to episode one with cracking that safe, or episode two when three kids are allowed to stroll into a prison disguised as a retirement home. It's even more bizarre when there's a comment about Lee having made various escape attempts over the years. You're telling me these three are allowed to wander in and make a grand escape by walking into their van and basically driving off, yet Lee couldn't make it out on his own? I'm not buying it. All right, I'm starting to feel a little hypocritical because I complained about how bitter these characters are, and now, listen to me. Hopefully Tony and Johanna have good things to say about this show. And hey, I do too. I loved all the stuff in the past. 
Keiko, Billy, and Lee were great characters. Actually, it kind of makes Kong Skull Island a bummer in retrospect. The way Bill disappears as a background character and then meets a pretty unsatisfying end. In the present, I thought Kurt Russell was great. Not only was he a fun character, but his motivations made sense. Sealing the gateway between our world and the Titans is both a need to be proactive and protect humanity, but also a need for redemption after losing Keiko. I also love his dedication to being proactive. Anytime there's indecision or hesitation, he just barrels ahead. Kentaro thinks he saw a structure and wants to check it out. Okay, go ahead, but we're gonna head toward the bright light. Kate doesn't wanna follow Godzilla. Okay, that's the way toward civilization. We're heading out. Or when she isn't sure closing the gateway in Kazakhstan is the right move, seconds later, he arms the bombs. It backfires on him, but you can understand emotionally why he is this way. His friends began Monarch as a proactive organization, trying to understand our world. Since then, he's watched Monarch tarnish their legacy by turning into desk jockeys with their heads in the sand. I already mentioned his and Keiko's reunion, which I thought was genuinely heartbreaking. The way Lee doesn't want to show himself right away, and his voice breaks while he explains why. That was 33. 33 years ago. And the emotion in her voice when she realizes all she's missed and lost. My heart also broke when Hiroshi reunites with Kentaro. It happens while Kate is lost in Access Monday, so everyone thinks she's dead. And when her dad finds out she's gone thanks to him, he breaks down. And I felt it, though it was a bit undermined by how much I disliked the character. And of course, I also felt it when Lee had to let go rather than come home. Though, fingers crossed, if there's a season two, we get to see more of him. Ultimately, I didn't hate this show because there were parts of it I really enjoyed. But sometimes it was a bit of a slog to get through the present storyline. I also appreciated the more serious tone, showing that just because the movies are leaning into more silly, spectacle territory, there's still room for something closer to Godzilla, the movie which started the franchise. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap this one up. Tony, Johanna, please say some good things about this show. Hmm, that's one way to review Monarch. And now we're going to talk about <laughs> it. How did you like Monarch? I liked it. Um, the bouncing around in the different timelines got a little like, ugh, but I know why they did it. Like, yeah. It makes sense now. Um, Kate's great. Uh, Kurt Russell's great. Uh, I did not expect as much Godzilla as we got. Yeah, people were complaining that he wasn't in enough. I'm like, I didn't expect him to be in it as much yeah, as he was. Like, I thought it was going to be a show about Monarch. I thought this is where they're going to mainly focus on like all the people. But then I got a yeah. nice little surprise with every other episode. I, um... I was also pleasantly surprised. Um, we talked about it more in our like full review, but like for a series, a franchise where people have been complaining that the characters aren't that good and we have to spend so much time with these characters we don't like, I, I we personally liked the characters mm -hmm. in this. Yes, they are kind of awful, but like in an entertaining, interesting way. Not like yeah. it's an annoying character. It's like, well, that, that character's kind of a piece of shit. Let's, yeah. see, <laughs> let's see if there's a redemption for him. Um, I didn't mind the bouncing around. I thought that was fun. Uh, the, the craziest thing about this is, um, the best way I described it was like, it feels like a comic that has to explain what happens yes. between movies. Cause we talked about how like the first one's so serious. And then it, like, if you're just watching the movies, they kind of devolve into crazy campiness. And this show is kind of like filling in the gap. So like they're showing all this stuff that leads to Mechagodzilla really early, uh, so I like that. I kind of want to see more of it. I want to see what it leads into. It kind of ends on an awesome cliffhanger mm -hmm. with Skull Island. Uh, but yeah, overall, it's a good time. I think more people need to give it a chance. And uh, yeah, I, I give it a great. Same. You can do the... <laughs> okay. That was more positive than my review, but suspiciously brief for a 10-episode series. Kind of seems like you ran out of good things to say about it pretty fast. Also, I, I we personally liked the characters mm -hmm. in this. I don't know if I believe you. Let me dig into that full review you did on Castzilla. Like Kate and them are fine. Like a lot of people like hate them for whatever reason. But I'm like, sorry. I'm just... sorry. Did you say Kate was fine? Wait a minute. What kind of podcast is this? Kate is pretty fine. I... Speaking of fine. <laughs> oh, Hello. hi. What the? Oh. 
Oh, I put them on top of the refrigerator so my nephews didn't. What is going on here? Yeah, a lot of people hate the younger characters, and I hate that I picked the most low poly picture ever for this slide. The Here's the thing. And I said in the previous episode, they actually are kind of unlikable, but I think they're interesting compared to a lot of the other characters we've gotten in the Mon MonsterVerse. Yeah. Because I like that he's like an artist and he has daddy issues. And then I like that she hates her dad for cheating. And then you find out that she was cheating on her girlfriend. So she's kind of projecting yeah. a little bit. Okay, fair enough. See, one take is balanced. You get to hear both sides of the debate. You get the objective analysis and uh, all the other stuff. Now we come to the main event the latest team-up of Godzilla and Kong, the most recent entry in the MonsterVerse, Godzilla x Kong The New Empire. This movie represents uncharted territory for the franchise, because for a few years it was all about building up to Godzilla vs. Kong. That movie's success is what told Legendary Pictures the audience wants more. And given the early box office success of this movie, it's clear the demand is still there. But what do audiences know? Let's check it out for ourselves and see if this movie is any good. This is 2024's Godzilla x Kong Frozen Empire. Sorry, I mean Godzilla x Kong The New Empire. Three years after defeating Mechagodzilla, Kong enjoys his home in the Hollow Earth. But he is lonely and spends his days searching for others of his kind. On the surface, Godzilla regularly protects humanity when other titans get out of hand. And as long as things stay that way, Godzilla above and Kong below, there should be no risk of another flare-up in their ancient rivalry. But soon, Monarch picks up a strange signal from the Hollow Earth. And so does Gia. She wakes from frantic dreams, scribbling a pattern, which Andrews notices is a perfect match for that signal. The idea her daughter could telepathically receive these signals is crazy, so she finds someone who knows crazy, Titan truther Bernie Hayes. And of course he'll help, especially if Dr. Andrews can sign him up for a trip to the Hollow Earth. Their meeting is cut short when she receives an alert that Godzilla is on the move, meaning he detects some kind of threat. And another alert, Kong has come to the surface. They quickly realize why. He's in pain and knows that he needs help. The Titan vet, Trapper, identifies the infected tooth, rips it out, and replaces it with a new one. With one crisis solved, Bernie arrives with another. With help from his Discord, he realizes that the signal is a psychic energy distress call. Historically, it's been observed just before Godzilla responds to a threat, meaning something dangerous is coming, and they won't wait to find out what it is. Instead, they take a trip into the hollow earth with Kong to search out the source of that SOS call. Once inside, Kong heads home and they head for the monarch outpost, which they find destroyed next to a giant handprint. This was done by a giant ape, but not Kong. And for the first time since his parents were killed, Kong meets others of his species. He inadvertently breaks open a passage to the subterranean realm, where he finds a small child and a few adults who don't take kindly to this intruder. They attack, but find they're no match for King Kong. One ends up dead, and the others retreat. Kong wants to know where they've gone, and after seeing his power, the child acquiesces. He shows him the way, but lures Kong into a trap when he sees opportunity, grabbing a drink in waters he knows are occupied by a snake-like titan. When that titan's head is promptly separated from his body, the child gets an idea just how strong Kong really is. As they make a meal of the titan, fear and distrust are replaced with respect and friendship. Meanwhile, Eileen, Bernie, and Trapper discover that Gia is not the last of the Iwi after all. Hidden in the Hollow Earth is an advanced tribe who communicate telepathically and use large crystals to manipulate gravity. They are the ones who sent out the SOS for Godzilla, 
using one of those crystals as a beacon. They bring their visitors to a room covered in iwi script, which tells a story. In the beginning, Hollow Earth lived in harmony with the surface world. The Titans were the guardians of nature, and the great apes became the protectors of humanity. But a great evil threatened the peace. A powerful and ruthless ape, desperate to conquer the surface world, led his tribe into war against Godzilla. They nearly destroyed him, but Godzilla won the battle and imprisoned the apes deep within the Hollow Earth. Their false king remains obsessed with reaching the surface. The Iwi call him the Scar King. He harnesses a terrible power. The ancient titan Shimo, who he controls with pain. Her icy breath is so powerful, it previously covered the earth in its last ice age. With Kong searching for more of his kind, the Iwi knew it would only be a matter of time before he inadvertently reached the false king. That's why they called for Godzilla's help. Soon, Kong and the child reach the prison, where Kong is witness to an army of apes laboring under the false king's rule. The Scar King challenges Kong. Between his bone whip and Kong's axe, it's a close and bloody fight, until the king uses his crystal to call on Shimo. Before long, Kong is retreating with an arm covered in frostbite, and Eileen continues reading the Iwi script, revealing how, at the end of the world, one of their own will return to awaken Mothra. They believe their savior will be a native from Skull Island. Of course, they're talking about Gia. Soon, Kong arrives with help from his new little friend, then gets help from his human friends. Trapper treats the frostbite and gives him a prototype they'd been working on, the Beast Glove. Not only does it return use of Kong's arm, but also augments its strength. But even Kong knows that won't be enough to face the Scar King and Shimo. He knows that he needs to call once again on that unlikely ally, Godzilla, who has been on a journey of his own. Receiving that distress call, Godzilla knew he would need to power up. So he swallowed the radiation of a nuclear plant in France, then slayed the Titan Tiamat, whose lair is the largest stockade of energy on Earth. Once Kong reaches the surface in Cairo and attracts Godzilla's attention, he finds his old rival more powerful than ever. Kong tries to show Godzilla he comes in peace, but the lizard only sees an enemy. The rivals and once allies fight until the prophecy is fulfilled. Gia awakens Mothra, and the queen of the monsters gets her king to stand down and finally, the two rivals become allies once again to face the Scar King in the Hollow Earth. But soon, their fight takes them through a vortex, and the battle continues on the surface in Rio de Janeiro. Godzilla and Kong versus the Scar King and Shimo, with crowds of bystanders caught in between. The tide of the battle turns decisively when Godzilla rips the crystal off the Scar King's whip and the child destroys it. Kong picks up the false king, and with Shimo freed of his rule, she treats him to her icy breath. Kong looks into the frozen Scar King's eyes, then shatters him to pieces. With their victory claimed, the rivals part ways, and Bernie, Eileen, Gia, and the Iwi tribe celebrate as Kong returns to the subterranean realm with Shimo and the child at his side. They raise their arms victoriously as the apes below them cheer at their newfound freedom. Hmm, that, that was a really fun movie. Since King of the Monsters, when the franchise transitioned from slightly more serious efforts to pure monster carnage, I felt that it was still trapped between two worlds, kind of like Axis Mundi. Godzilla vs. Kong had a lot of fun stuff but it was still bogged down to some extent by boring characters and lame side stories. In my view, the franchise would be better served by picking a direction and running with it. If you don't want to tell character-driven stories, embrace the silliness and insanity, then go further with it. Godzilla x Kong for me, 
took a big step in that direction. The movie is filled with more interesting concepts than the rest of the movies combined. We see giant machines used to perform titan surgery after the introduction of telepathy in the credits of King of the Monsters, then some actual use of it in Godzilla vs. Kong. This movie makes it a major component of the plot. We find out there's a hidden Iwi tribe who uses it as their primary means of communication. We find out they control big crystals to manipulate gravity, and their home is protected by a bioelectric organic membrane. I love discovering this new area of the hollow earth and unveiling this civilization. Like the Kong plot in Godzilla vs. Kong, it carried a lot of momentum thanks to the steady stream of revelations, tapping into that fun sense of discovery. In that previous movie, though, we were also cutting back and forth to a B-plot following Madison and Bernie, which often halted that momentum. Thankfully, that is much less of a problem in this movie, because the other story is Kong himself, meeting that mini-Kong, apparently named Suko according to some toy packaging, and discovering the Scar King's lair. This portion of the movie is by far my favorite, and maybe even my favorite of the franchise. Part of that is because it taps into subject matter I always find addictive. I've gone down so many rabbit holes watching videos or reading about animal intelligence. Did you know dolphins have signature whistles which basically function as names they call each other by? Did you know chimps have political machinations just like you'd see in Game of Thrones? If not, do yourself a favor and watch Chimp Empire on Netflix. Throughout these movies, I have loved watching Kong's expressions and behavior to better understand his intelligence. So watching him meet these other Kongs, seeing how they communicate non-verbally was fascinating. Honestly, I would have loved a two-hour film without dialogue, just watching these giant apes and observing more of their culture. These sequences were not only fascinating, but also pretty funny. It's kind of cheating because animals activate a part of our brain that just makes us more open to feeling. Like, it's impossible not to smile at Godzilla turning the Colosseum into his resting spot. He curls up to sleep there early in the movie and then does it again at the end, and that had my theater laughing. I laughed out loud a few times. When Kong meets Suko and holds out his hand, only for the kid to bite his finger. Then a couple minutes later, when Kong picks him up and uses him as a club on the adult apes attacking him. Or when Suko lures Kong into a fight with that snake. The way he's drinking water while very obviously eyeing Kong, waiting for the inevitable attack. Jumping ahead, my absolute favorite moment possibly of the entire franchise, has to be when Kong reaches the surface in Cairo. Godzilla starts running at him, and Kong signals, wait, come with me into the vortex. But Godzilla ignores him and just keeps running, so Kong holds up his hands like, no, 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 but there's no reasoning with Godzilla, and it's hilarious. The human side of the story also has humor that worked better for me than the previous movies. Bernie, for example, I didn't find him that funny in Versus Kong, but here, I thought he was pretty entertaining. I think the difference is that he's a little crazy, but in the last movie, didn't have anyone to play off of because Madison was also a little crazy. It's like sketch comedy that's missing the straight man. But in this movie, he's hanging out with Dr. Eileen Andrews, then the Iwi tribe, so there's plenty of juxtaposition to his antics. Though, sometimes I found myself laughing and wasn't sure if it was with the movie or at the movie, because it sometimes comes off as self-parody. The biggest example is the gun-toting monarch guard who goes with them into the hollow earth. Out of nowhere, he just starts yelling and getting angry, which gets him eaten by a plant. He was the only no-name character among them, so you know he was just there to die, but it was done so blatantly and over the top, it felt like parody. Or the Trapper character in general. The yelling guy calls him Ace Ventura, and it's spot on, because he does feel like a character from another movie who just wandered in. Speaking of Ace Ventura, the movie also has a retro feel, which I enjoyed, but I'm not sure why it's here. The soundtrack is filled with music from the 70s and 80s, including Kiss and Bad Finger. The newest song on the soundtrack is Hardwired by Jordan F. from just a couple of years ago, but even that song is done in an 80s style. Actually, funny story behind that track. 
This and the last movie are directed by Adam Wingard, and earlier in his career, back in 2013, he had just impressed Peter Jackson with his movie, You're Next, a movie I remember enjoying. And he was in talks to direct Skull Island, a sequel to Jackson's King Kong. That movie got abandoned, and instead, Wingard focused on a movie called The Guest, starring Dan Stevens, who plays Trapper in this movie. Anyway, there were talks of a sequel which never materialized, but Wingard decided to produce an album called The Guest 2, basically a soundtrack for a non-existent movie. And on that soundtrack was Hardwired, the track featured in this movie. I really enjoyed the soundtrack and the retro vibe. Again, not sure why it's here. Maybe Wingard just enjoys that vibe, or maybe it fits the demographic of this movie. Either way, I liked it, thought it added some fun. Like I said for Godzilla vs. Kong, for a spectacle movie, the key is momentum. Keeping things exciting and entertaining, enough so that you don't notice the thin characters and sometimes ridiculous plot. Overall, I thought the movie was pretty successful at it. Though there is still a sort of B-plot in the movie, which sometimes slows things down. Both movies treat Kong as more of a protagonist than Godzilla, which makes sense. He's more expressive and easier for us human viewers to relate to. But neither movie quite figures out what to do with Godzilla in the meantime. In this one, he's gathering power and preparing for the battle ahead. Anytime we cut to him, I found it kind of boring. Oh, he's sucking up a bunch of radiation at a nuclear plant. Okay, he's killing Tiamat, which was really easy. Plus, there are a bunch of nothing characters commenting on all of it. Anytime we cut to Godzilla, I just wanted to get back to Kong. And actually, once Eileen and Gia reached the room filled with Iwi's script, I felt the same way. With the Kong story, I was wondering how they would communicate the plot with silent animals. Kong knows sign language, so I wondered if maybe the other apes had developed their own form of communication. It turns out they don't seem to have complex language, but instead do a lot of pointing and gesturing, but it's not like we get subtitles or anything like that. And I was impressed they stuck to that. Except that room with Iwi's script is pure exposition. That's where everything gets spelled out, and it kind of brings things to a halt. I think the filmmakers knew it too, because we cut from Eileen reading that script back to Kong's fight a couple of times to break up the scene. But overall, it's just a pure exposition dump, and includes a weird deus ex machina, a prophecy that an Iwi native from Skull Island will come to awaken Mothra. A couple of weird things there. One, I get that it's a prophecy, and maybe that's reason enough for Gia to be special, but it doesn't manifest in any satisfying way. What exactly does Gia do to fulfill that prophecy? She walks up some steps and holds up her hand. And that's it, then Mothra wakes up. Watching it, it just feels like any one of them could have done that, but there's just some random magic which says, no, it has to be Gia. But why? By what mechanism? For everything else, there's some pseudoscience, telepathy, crystals that affect gravity, but here, what is it? Something reading her DNA? And again, just why? Why her? And why not make it a challenge where she has to do something to free Mothra? Or, or make her sing like the show Bijin? The other weird thing is that if I remember correctly, in King of the Monsters, Mothra died. So how is she back in this movie? Now, Tony actually explained this to me offline. First off, the reason she feels a little random in this movie is they weren't sure they'd get the rights to use Mothra again. So they made up a new Titan named Phosphora, but late last year they got the rights to Mothra and inserted her into the movie. That's why you don't actually see anyone say Mothra's name on screen. It's all added in ADR, meaning lines they recorded after filming. And how is she alive? Apparently the King of the Monsters credits reveal there was another egg, so this could be a new Mothra, or it could just be an older one who's been living in the Hollow Earth. Either way, I found it weird no one would question it. Especially Bernie. The Bernie I know would not have been able to stop himself from explaining to everyone just how Mothra is alive again. But if when they filmed the movie it was Phosphora, not Mothra, that would explain why no one said anything. In general, I think Kaylee Hoddle, the actress who plays Gia, 
does a great job with the role, and I'd love to see more. I've kind of accepted by this point. If both Godzilla and Kong are in the title of the movie, you're not getting a lot of character development. I only get a little frustrated because the potential is there, and it's mostly unrealized. This movie starts with Gia in school, and we're told she's having a hard time fitting in, which is unsurprising considering her circumstances, but we're only told it. We don't actually see it at all, except that she looks sad while walking to class. I think it would have been good to show more, because part of the movie's emotional core is Eileen trying to figure out how to best take care of her daughter. Once they meet the Iwi tribe, Eileen is torn because it seems the best way to help Gia might be to let her go and stay with her people. But in the end, Gia reminds Eileen that her home is with her. That moment would have been a lot more impactful if the movie did more to draw that juxtaposition between Gia in the surface world and Gia in the hollow earth where she feels more accepted. In that way, we could truly feel why she might choose to stay over returning with her adoptive mother. But like I said, I've accepted that these movies are more about the sense of discovery and the action. And the action here is pretty great. The only thing missing for a bit was the sense of scale. Because when you're underground and everyone is giant, it may as well be that no one is giant. Once they're on the beach, though, there's one moment where the Scar King is looking down at all the scattering people, and they just look like ants in the sand. It was one of the few times where these monsters are genuinely terrifying. I realized that in previous movies, we either see the Titans in cities, where people are mostly in cars or buildings, or they're in places like Antarctica, where there aren't many people around. But to see a titan looking down at a crowd in the sand, it has the effect of making us look even more puny, which I thought was really effective. And the final battle, seeing Kong and Godzilla working together, the clash of fighting styles between two apes and two lizards, was a lot of fun. My only gripe is that I think the movie could have built up the Scar King more. I needed them to convince me he is a match for Godzilla, who is already quite powerful, and spends the movie getting even more powerful. Of course they try to accomplish this with Shimo, but it didn't quite get there for me. Yes, they say she caused the last Ice Age, but it goes back to show, don't tell. They tell us she caused an Ice Age, but the only thing they show is that she gives Kong some frostbite. I was never really convinced the Scar King, even with Shimo's help, could stand up to Godzilla and his atomic breath. But bottom line, I had a lot of fun with this movie. I think it embraced Titan insanity more than the previous movies and did a better job of just letting loose. Now, if you want to know what Tony and Johanna thought, you're going to want to head over to their YouTube channel or subscribe to their podcast feed where they have a full episode on the movie. And they can put it into context with decades of Godzilla and Kong history better than I can because I know the MonsterVerse pretty well. And I've seen a few of the movies outside that, but they are much deeper into the catalog than I am. I'm going to let them say goodbye now, then we'll wrap up our journey. And if you want to hear more of us talking about Godzilla... If this was such a good sampling and you're like, I need to know more, you can go to Kessel versus the Pod Monster on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. You can go to castzilla.com because I added an S when I made the URL and I didn't realize it and now we're stuck with it. Uh, so go there. That'll take you to the podcast feed. Uh, yeah, we're every other Wednesday-ish. We don't have the most consistent schedule because we have other shows and we're very busy. But uh, yeah, it's a fun time. We do a live show every time and uh, you can join in on it, leave a super chat and whatnot. And uh, yeah, we're in the Heisei series right now. Yeah, and I'm excited. At the time of this recording, what's been your favorite one that we've reviewed in the Heisei series? Mothra. The Rebirth or Godzilla versus Mothra? Mothra. Just just and the character Mothra. 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 <laughs> You looked at just a picture of Mothra as yeah. your favorite. Okay. Yep. Okay. Mothra. We're, we're <laughs> no. So much great insight like that on no, the No, it's Rebirth. <laughs> rebirth, really? Yeah. Huh. Huh. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we're making our way through that. Eventually, we're going to get to the Millennium Series. And we will be talking. We do uh, first impressions for the new releases. So we did one for Godzilla Minus One. And we will be doing one so for good. Godzilla X-Kong, the new Empire. 
We've also done little videos where we unbox all these toys. Uh, so subscribe for all that. And Gil, thanks again for having us. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you, Johanna, for sharing your thoughts and helping to get more points of view into the video and giving me a chance to rest my voice between recaps and reviews, especially after that timeline. My voice is getting a little bit tired. And Planet of the Apes is coming up, so I'm gonna need it. Anyway, so here we are at the end of the journey, and what a journey it's been. Lots of ups, lots of downs. To me, the MonsterVerse is a strange franchise because the tone has shifted so much from one movie to another and one show to another. In a way, I like that because it helps to keep things fresh rather than everything feeling like the same thing. Going forward, I definitely want them to keep having fun with the Godzilla Kong mashups, but I would love if they took a page out of Minus One or Godzilla 2014's book and did more serious takes on the characters too. Maybe if they do more solo movies, those ones can be a little deeper, and then for the mashups, they can just go nuts. Thankfully, like I said, this movie is doing well, so I have no doubt there is more MonsterVerse on the way, and I'll be here for it. If you haven't checked out my timeline, I'll link to it. It goes into a lot more detail than the recaps here, plus it pulls in the comics, which fill in some of the gaps and provide more backstory. With that, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more. Thank you for watching, and see you on the next One Take. Shaking his hand. Okay. <laughs> All right, that was it. That was good.